And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Oh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the ideas room tonight already. Of course, tonight I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And um, Olivia, I know when to go out mm -hmm. and I know when to stay in mm -hmm. and get things done. Yep. <laughs> and what we're going to get done tonight is X Series 160. You've joined us on a very special evening because this is a Kashik Rewind, Atlantis. Future Past, Edgar Casey, Rudolf Steiner, and Plato, Visions of Tomorrow and Yesterday, along with Helena Blavatsky of Theosophy and Anthroposophy, Spiritual Science. They're all here as a foundation that we're going to see relates directly to the 21st century and our future and um, the illustrious past that we just started to know about thanks to the mystery schools and the reading of the Akashic Record The Akashic Record being such a central, uh, important point to all of these teachings, because without the Akashic Record, you're pretty much left in the dark, because most of the things were covered up over time. And we're going to be getting into that tonight, and we're going to get into it through the figure of Edgar Cayce and Plato and Rudolf Steiner and Helena Blavatsky. Now, um, one of the things that I want to say in terms of how we cover the mystery schools in particular is that these are the public mystery schools, and behind them is a huge network that is, is very intangible and difficult to kind of put your finger on. But we hear names like the Sarmung Brotherhood or the Great White Brotherhood or the Emilius Mystery. Uh, and, you know, this has a thread that brings us all through the um, different mysteries, going all the way back to Pythagoras and then before uh, with the Book of the Dead, the Akhenaten Mysteries, Elijah's School of the Prophets, the Essenes, and the Goddess Temples um, of Murius. So we have quite a thread here of some version of humanity keeping these ancient secrets and moving that consciousness forward over time so that it resurfaces at crucial times and critical periods in human history. And we have reached that crisis in human affairs. So what did they leave for us and what can we expect to find? That's what we're going to get into tonight through the Akashic Record and just how unusual a concept that is, but central to all these mystery teachings. Of course, tonight uh, in the second half of the program, we are going to be taking your questions. And um, with that, you can ask the questions at any time during the show. And Miss Olivia will be putting those together. And before I go any further now tonight, Miss Olivia, how are we doing out there? Doing great. I think everybody missed the show last week. Yes. I know I did. I feel very rusty. Tonight. Well, we're working very, very heavily on this special presentation for you, November 17th. And I'm not going to say too much about it tonight, but you have to be there at November 17th right here or at darkjournalist.com. Uh, we'll we'll be live streaming this special presentation, JFK 60. That is the blue enigma secret space program and 60 years of that outgrowth of a secret government. This is a very special uh, presentation that we'll be doing on the 17th. So mark your calendars now, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be there with you. And um, I think some people are going to be seriously, um, there's, there's going to be a lot of very fascinating things raised. And um, so we're taking the extra time to work on it special. I'm going to get more into that tonight to let you know more about what's coming uh, in terms of that, and before we go any further now, I want to make sure also, especially if you're new here, that you sign up for the Dark Journalist newsletter. That's a free newsletter, and you get it at darkjournalist.com. Uh, this is the best way for us to stay in touch. I've had a myriad of different types of people tell me the kind of blocking that happens with the material that we do. Uh, on social media, and especially uh, right here on YouTube. But nonetheless, we persist, and we're happy to be here with it. But the best way to get around all that censorship is to get the newsletter, and that lets you know about the exciting events that we have coming up, documentaries, uh, X-Series episodes, and fantastic interviews that we have coming up for you in November and December. Uh, just kind of going to blow your mind with that one. And uh, it basically takes 30 seconds to sign up and make sure that you do it because uh, that's going to put you in the front line to stand up and be counted with all the special material we're going to be bringing forward for subscribers. And when it comes to events and things like that, subscribers are going to get the heads up first. So make sure that you're at least uh, on that list of 
newsletter subscribers, if you really want to be first, of course, <laughs> uh, support the show and become a member. We've made it very inexpensive um, and you get a lot of bonus content and invites to some very exciting things that we have coming up uh, along with these very special uh, documentaries that we have coming down the pike for you. And the timing couldn't be more right, in my opinion. And it's interesting because we just came out of this mystery October that we were doing, and there was so much material that was left because, um, you know, it was there was a lot of juggling going on there with the work that we're doing for the JFK 60 Secret Space um, presentation. So some of that pre <laughs> presentation is tonight. And it has all to do with the Akashic Records and Atlantis future past. Manu and Emilius and Rata and the whole story of Atlantis as told to us through the incredible subconscious mind of Edgar Casey and uh, Rudolf Steiner and others who put this on the map. And when you really connect those dots over time, it's quite remarkable because the things that they laid out have really come to pass, which really sounded like science fiction when they were talking about it, say, in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, so they were giving us a heads up, some kind of a warning, you could say, about the things that were coming up. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, all their warnings are on the front line right mm -hmm. now. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, we're kind of living in a Terminator reality, as, as, it, as it were. Um, I want to actually start off tonight by giving a quick heads up around the political dynamics that are going on in the race for 2024. In fact, um, a lot of things have shaken up over the past week and a half. And uh, some of them are disturbing, of course, as usual. But I want to... <laughs> Name one that isn't disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One of the things I want to put on board is, um, you know, the 2024 election is crucial. And I think that there is some kind of uh, effort by the Biden regime to spread through social media that, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. And, you know, if you are in that kind of alternative camp, the disaffected camp, you know, it's like, save your vote. They're all bad, you know. And, um, you know, oh, that Bobby Kennedy, you know, he, he uh, he's a climate Nazi. <laughs> or, you know, oh, that Trump, just forget about him. And, you know, just leave the field wide open and step for Biden, who they're controlling behind the scenes with the committee, is going to get us into World War III and uh, flood the entire country with immigrants so we have a civil war. Now, that's the, the nature of the situation that we find ourselves in at the just at the outset here before 2024 hits. I told you all during 2023 that 23 was the setup year for the 2024 elections. Everything that happens between here and January 1 really says it all for what's going to go down. This is actually the staging ground. And what we've seen so far is war upon war upon war in the United States of Lockheed Martin, which is what we're rapidly becoming if we don't stop this and get the Biden regime out of office. It has to be done. And coming in on one side are the Trump forces. Coming in on the other side are the Bobby Kennedy forces um, with that you know, ability to ignite a populist movement that will smash um, everything that we see going on here. Now, one of the things I want to point out is since the uh, Bobby Kennedy campaign has gone independent, there has been some stumbling that's been going on. And um, part of it is that uh, Bobby has a daughter-in-law named Amaryllis, who is now the campaign manager for uh, Kennedy 24. And you know, she doesn't have the experience to run a national campaign. So they lost Kucinich for some reason or another. And I didn't think he was going to be dynamic enough to run it either. So they need somebody who's really seasoned, who can really knock this out of the park. You have a lot of things to put forward, you know, and a lot of the messaging is is not on point, in my opinion. Uh, it's getting too personal now. They're talking too much about his own background and things like that. That's actually not what's important. What are you going to do? as president of the United States. Stick to the point and stick it to President Biden. And I use the word president very loosely. And this is what that campaign needs to be doing, really going after the front runner. So what you have instead is them saying, well, you know, I'm not going to stigmatize anyone in particular, but the whole system is bad. No, you have to specify it and bring it down to President Biden and the Biden regime destroying America. 
by leaving the borders wide open, the destructive inflation, uh, the terrible economic numbers that came out, you know, um, and the just kind of laughing stock that he's made of America stumbling around and inflaming all these situations, uh, Ukraine and in the Middle East, uh, setting up for war and to become the patron of these defense contractors. You have to stop it by name. You can't use kind of loose terms about, you know, we need to reinstall common sense. No, you have to get rid of the incumbent because that's who you're running against. You're not actually running against Trump. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, the president is the person that you're running against. So the Kennedy campaign needs to go after Biden or it's not going to happen. That's just the fact of it. And if you don't activate that before we get to January, then it's a missed opportunity. So either they're going to do that. You know, it's great that there's things happening and there's fundraisers in LA and stuff, but you, you have to get on the ground and take on this president. That's what Bobby Kennedy did against LBJ. And um, he didn't hold any punches in relation to that, you know. So, and just running against LBJ at that point was such an affront, uh, especially since LBJ had been JFK's VP. So there's a whole lineage here and there's a little bit of a feeling since it went independent that the only thing it's doing now is becoming like a protest candidacy, which is the last thing you want it to be, because uh, in that sense, it would just siphon off votes from the anti-Biden train that is that is coming in with Trump. So what you need to do, in my opinion, and this is always my long distance advice directly to the Kennedy campaign, is to get on and really make it happen. Get out there and tell people what you're going to do and tell them why this administration needs to go and Biden has to go. Biden is stumbling around. Everyone knows that this guy is uh, mentally incompetent and he's going to stumble us directly through committee with Obama running him in the background into World War III. So it's a very dangerous situation. And I want the Kennedy campaign to get on top of that. The other thing is right now, you know, the independent candidacy is a very tricky thing because you need to be on the ballot in all 50 states in order to win 270 electoral votes. So there's no way to say like, hey, we got on 20 states. You can't win that way. So um, there's another factor going on in the 2024 election. It's called the No Labels Party. Well, this thing has been in development for a while. And what they want to do, they're planning to run a Democrat and a Republican. They've been talking about Joe Manchin or whatever. And I happen to think that Joe Manchin is uh, kind of a phony conservative who always talks tough, but then goes along with Biden and his ridiculous expenditures, you know, hey, let's spend $87 billion on uh, <laughs> all these new IRS agents. Now, um, so what, what's going to happen there is there's going to be a significant tilt from that effort. Those people are already on the ballot in 28 states because they were ready for an independent campaign. The Bobby campaign came in as a Democrat, and uh, he was going to take him on democratically. And it's true that Biden has cheated so that even if Bobby had won in places like New Hampshire and Iowa, which, which I'm sure he will <laughs> coming up, um, they were going to take those votes and delegates and add them to the Biden administration. So he's like, I'm out of there. I'm going to do the independent thing. But the problem, and I already hear excuses coming out of, from people who are running the campaign saying like, well, it's a, it's a myriad process. It's, you know, it's very difficult to get on all 50 states, but through a hero heroic effort, we'll do it. it. It's probably, you know, it's, it's very late in the process to do that. You know, my suggestion would be pick a party um, like the Libertarian Party, who's already on the ballot in all 50 states, and it eliminates the problem. Something like that needs to happen in order to make the whole process viable. Otherwise, we're looking at something which just looks too incredibly difficult, and that's exactly what the Bidenistas want. And they want those divisions to happen between the two populist forces that are trying to take out the central regime. The only way that regime can sustain itself is by turning those forces against each other. So that's my uh, take on that. And I want to say that there's been a kind of a vicious um, campaign going on on the political side against Bobby Kennedy. So atrocious, in fact, of course, and against Trump as well. But um, some of these things that Vanity Fair is, is pulling, I really think there should be, you know, <laughs> some complaints thrown Vanity Fair's way because they have made their own illustrations of Bobby, you know, calling him a conspiracy theorist and all these things. And, you know, Bobby's been out there making a lot of sense, telling us to stay out of wars and uh, to get the handle back 
on the people who've been running the government and uh, not to let the pharmaceutical companies run the world, as it were. And, um, you know, he, he hasn't been perfect in the things he's been saying, but my God, he's really put a lot of truth out there. And my original response and reaction to people who were nitpicking things about his past was to say, look, you know, if you get somebody speaking that much transparency, you know, you're never going to get Mr. Perfect. It doesn't happen. And it's very important to take someone who's putting it on the line and bringing forward your issues. So basically, in fact, you know, the Trump forces, the Kennedy forces, they are our army, as it were, on the field. And that's why the, we need to get behind those people. So when I saw a lot of people being like, well, Bobby, you know, should talk about how he's um, so in favor of the Second Amendment. And that's, that's when he was running as a Democrat. And... Uh, you know, that's not how you win Democrat votes. So it wasn't logical. So there's a lot of kind of stupid stuff going on and a lot of people just not getting behind Kennedy early on. I think that was a mistake. And uh, so we need to kind of change that around. But the intense criticism from the media shows that they are afraid of uh, Bobby's campaign. Look at what they did in this illustration to Bobby Kennedy. I mean, you know, <laughs> try to really take that illustration, just make him look insane. This is what this media is made of, which is, you know, go after Biden's enemies, as it were. Look at that. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were kind of bragging about, hey, you know, like we spent four hours and we kind of tricked him into it because we said we were going to do a balanced piece. But here we are calling him uh, a crazy man. Um, but it is interesting because Politico followed up with a story and they said RFK Jr.'s donor data reveals his 20... 24 threat. And what they were saying basically is that a lot of the money that is flowing into the Bobby campaign is uh, coming out of the, uh, who would be the, the Trump donors. So that's the trick there. Will the populist Trump donors, you know, throw their hat into an independent run? And will that take any of the thunder away from uh, President Trump's effort, which is going to be a tight effort um, regardless because of the amount of uh, shenanigans that go on in the process. So um, this is some of the the things and some of the balancing that should go out. What should happen immediately is there should be a summit between the Trump campaign and the Kennedy campaign to make sure they don't step on each other's toes. And really the central object should be to remove the Biden regime. That has to get to uh, Bobby Kennedy. And of course, we've had Bobby on the show and we plan to have him on again. But in the meantime, uh, this message really <laughs> needs to get out to him if he wants to be a major factor in 2024 and not just something that was a nice idea and brought up some, some great issues, which he certainly has. And, uh, he's, he has the connections and that network is still there for the Kennedys. So let's see if, if uh, they can pull this off. And it's been great that, uh, the daughter-in-law could come in and sort of fill the gap for a while, but now you need a real campaign manager <laughs> and, uh, you know, you got the money, hire one, spend some money and, and do it. Um, Judge floats delay in Trump's classified documents trial. This is such a significant story that came out. And um, this is Judge Cannon saying, you know what? <laughs> this Jack Smith charade is ridiculous. We're not going to run the classified docs uh, case during the presidential election. It's election interference. That's what all the judges should be saying. So Trump got good news there uh, while he's in this ridiculous <laughs> civil trial in New York. And Trump really kind of, um, at this point, the main thing against Trump is they're going to try legal maneuvers from every end of the spectrum. So one of the maneuvers that they're trying with Trump right now is to get him off the ballot in places like Colorado. They tried it in New Hampshire, live free or die, <laughs> uh, New Hampshire, which is about an hour from here. And, um, you know, New Hampshire, they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no dice. Uh, we're not going for it. And um, now Colorado needs to do the same thing, but Colorado has much more of a Democrat um, twist, unfortunately. There's great people in Colorado, but the on the leadership side, we have a lot of problems. So um, what I would say there and that's going on there is that is election interference at its very heart. And that would turn us into a banana republic to take the leading candidate off the ballot. <laughs> Uh, using some phony amendment that doesn't mean anything, you know, oh, uh, he's leading an insurrection. Well, <laughs> sorry, but, uh, you know, Stepford Biden's about to cause World War III, so that's not going to fly. Um, 
And a few other things that came out, I wanted to put this across, which is that actually continuity of government is on the ballot. And this needs to be a big kind of meme for 2024, which is the COG people, if they don't get what they want, that is step for Biden in there for another four years, and they'll probably drag him in, you know, like weekend at Bernie's and then replace him with Gavin Newsom or somebody like that. So we can't allow that to happen um, because the country can't take it and they can't take you know, we can't take five years of open borders like that. That would destroy everything. So um, they came out recently with a report through the Pentagon saying, oh, those were unidentified objects that we shot down over Canada and over Alaska. So there's a lot of shady weirdness back in February. And uh, we did a, a series of episodes at that time when this was happening because of the bizarreness of the entire situation. Part of it was all about this balloon that sailed across America. It's a Chinese balloon. It's never happened before. We have tons of protocols against that. And NORAD just said, like, oops, they got through our sensors. Yeah, well, <laughs> then everyone at NORAD should be fired. There's no way in, in tarnation that happens because uh, the way it works is since World War II, you can't get anything in our skies like that. And uh, especially since back then, you know, they had a protocol because of these Japanese balloons that came over and exploded over Oregon. And um, what happened was some people died, actually, because there were poison bombs that the Japanese were sending over. So we adopted protocols back then. So uh, 75 years later, they come up and say, oh, our sensors didn't see this balloon. All that was bunk. And then afterwards, the New York Times had headlines like UFO shoot down, you know, and all this kind of nonsense that they were playing. Justin Trudeau, you know, gives this big heads up about a UFO shoot down. And this was intentional uh, because they had the NORAD COG Northcom commander Van Herc come out and talk and assure the nation that we shot down those objects and not Stepford Biden. So it was very significant. That's a glimpse, you know, kind of a crystal ball of things to come. So the continuity of government program is on the ballot in 2024. And um, the way to get rid of that entire threat is to really uh, spell out the differences with the Biden regime and uh, expose them and demolish the uh, entire campaign for Biden 2024. That's crucial. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Whew, we're going into a Kashuk Rewind, Atlantis, Future Past, Edgar Casey, Rudolf Steiner, and Plato, Helena Blavatsky, all these people told us something about the period that we're facing and moving into. And uh, boy, we're kind of heading into that Atlantean moment. And don't you think for a moment that we're not, but uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways that the Titanic can get around that iceberg if you see it in time. We're going to be taking your questions in part two of tonight's program. And uh, you can ask those now. Miss Olivia is putting those together. And, um, I noticed there's a lot of thumbs up for Miss Olivia out there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you were getting a lot of fan mail while I was working on this documentary. So uh, how are we doing out there? Doing great. I, th I think we should get straight into the mystery school stuff. I, I know personally, and I'm seeing in the chat uh, that, you know, enough of the politics. We're all is we need to escape it. Oh, no, no. These were the important politics. So I, I couldn't disagree with you more on that because the things we brought forward here are so crucial. And, uh, but absolutely, boy, have they been overflowing <laughs> and giving us a hard time on the political front. There's no question that, you know, you can get into this Twitter loop where people just kind of sink in and just suck into this whole kind of Facebook and uh, social media vibe and follow the headlines and run from reaction to reaction. And it gets very dangerous because um, what happens is they are, in fact, you know, kind of drilling through this thought push. And it is to control the thought form of the world, to bring it into a crisis, to bring it into um, a state of war. And what we see is that as a kind of a large scale psychological operation, which is usually run on a government level. And what's interesting to me is on the government side, um, that's one thing. But when you go one level deeper, into how this has been run from the beginning. You go much deeper than governments. That gets you into the secret societies and it gets you directly into the mystery schools, which is where we're heading tonight. And um, it's very interesting because 
when I was reviewing all the material around the Akashic record and really thinking about how the schools moved it into the culture, uh, it's quite fascinating because really what takes place in uh, the 1800s with the development of theosophy is the real link and correlation to the period that we run into. And as a matter of fact, those who would come later, like Steiner and Casey, would attribute this awakening of humanity directly back to the Theosophical Society, however flawed, and uh, the founder of Theosophy, Helena Blavatsky. And Blavatsky gets the kind of opening gate tonight. We're going to get into a number of things about Helena Blavatsky, which may be on or off the record. Um, and... You know, it's interesting. I've said this before in relation to uh, the Theosophical Society, which is um, theosophy has this position of being the trade-off, as it were, where the mystery school wars that were taking place between 1840 and 1870. And um, when you get into mystery schools, I just want to sum this up for people not familiar too much with the concept. Things like theosophy and anthroposophy the work of Gurdjieff and the work of Edgar Casey are public versions of these mystery schools. They bring forward the concepts and they're giving us that incredible heads up. But behind that structure back there, there are um, allusions to things like, for example, Ascended Masters, the Rosicrucians, and the Great White Brotherhood, and you know these different types of alliances the societies that run things behind the scenes and try to move that culture forward. That's what we're looking at. You know, they call the kind of invisible college as it were. And very often, um, you know, masonry comes in to that as well, because masonry seems to pick up on a lot of that hermetic signature of these mystery schools, although not necessarily being uh, exactly in the same vein. Now, um, What's interesting is there's a period, and I'm going to read some very crucial quotes. There's a period that shows up around 1840 where there's scientific materialism has taken hold on the culture. And the schools, in fact, realize this as a development. And it's something that the Steiner group and the spiritual science researchers, Steiner would call it Armon, using the term armonic forces. And this was the whole idea about a kind of a scientific religion. And uh, Armand itself, the term refers back to a Persian deity who is a dark deity. He is the opposite of a Hura Mazda. And he is his twin, his dark twin, the dark shadow. And um, he's often pictured being held at bay by a Hura Mazda, the Messiah creature, um, that figure of a Messiah who is holding him, and uh, he has simultaneously a sword in his navel and a hand uh, on his head. So he has to hold him at bay constantly. So the harmonic force and why Steiner would pick up this term in order to talk about what we were heading into for the 21st century and the technological overdrive is quite fascinating. Uh, we've covered Steiner and Ahriman and the Eighth Sphere. But the idea generally is that the period that we're in relates to a type of virtual reality that we're being sucked into. And that from viewed from an esoteric level where Steiner was looking at it, he could see what this force was doing and what it was building up for. And in fact, he had great visions of World War II um, because, you know, this is again, we're talking about 1910 to 1925. It's the real crucial period. Uh, with Steiner, and before that, he's part of the Theosophical Society. But Steiner is looking out, and he's seeing this force coming in, and this force is going to manifest itself um, in, in the 21st century as a full-on incarnation of this dark astral being. And uh, really, if you read between the lines on what Steiner says, it sounds like that incarnation, although it's a physical incarnation, comes through the technology. So this might be the ultimate kind of AI cyber android <laughs> ruler that they bring in. But there's no question that what he's trying to give us is a hint there. One of the things I've gone on record with in relation to Steiner is that he seems to be telling us 
uh, you know, he seemed to spend four decades telling us and warning us that this force was coming in and that the harmonic force was going to be tied in directly through the technology. And Steiner, far from saying, you know, go live in a mountain retreat and get away from the technology, was very uh, adamant that we stay there and really engage in this battle and overcome this harmonic force in this period. Although he, uh, you know, looking out through the centuries and into the future, didn't see it, <laughs> you know, in some of the other teachings, you kind of get this warm, fuzzy thing going on where they're looking out into the future and they say, hey, you know, the next root race is going to come in. They're all psychic. You know, we age of Aquarius, like the world learns how to cope with everything. It's a great vision. But Steiner is like, yeah, but in between, <laughs> before you get to this great nirvana, you're into the battle, the war of all against all. And um, so we, we really come into a period where the clash of forces is on. And this is the scientific materialism born in that period of 1840. Well, these schools looked out in that period and they said, within 100 years, humanity will not recognize itself. It'll be completely come off, uh, cut off from any type of spiritual connection. So what do we do in that period? How do we bring this out? So there was a small group within those mystery schools that had kept the traditions all the way back from Atlantis. And that includes going through Akhenaten and, um, you know, the Elijah schools, the Essenes and all the rest. And they decided what we're going to do is we're going to release things to the public. We're going to tell them about psychic experience. We're going to tell them about different realms. We're going to tell them about the astral body and so on, a whole range of esoteric teachings. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, resistance that was going on to this. But in any case, it was rolled out in some capacity in the 1850s and 60s, and it became the spiritualism craze in America. And um, some of the best examples were probably things like the Poughkeepsie Seer, this guy bringing forward these fascinating visions of the afterlife and um, kind of an early Casey type version. And the Fox sisters who would get all these, you know, peculiar raps and these spirits would be responding to them. It's kind of like an early Ouija board type thing. They became huge though, in a way, if you really go back to that period, they were in such demand <laughs> that people really wanted to know what are the Fox sisters all about? Mm. And what is this whole spiritualism craze all about? To the point where Abraham Lincoln's wife became an extreme follower of spiritualism and um, through the death of her son got into things like seances and mediumistic trance. Um, so one of the founders of theosophy, Emma Britton, was brought forward and she helped navigate that part of the world for Abraham Lincoln. And it's very interesting because later she would go on with Blavatsky to found the Theosophical Society in 1875. Now, it's interesting, um, a couple of, a number of ways to get in to what happened with Blavatsky, but here's a general, kind of a rough sketch of who we're dealing with here. This is somebody who was born into a, you know, a very well-respected family. And um, her dad was high-ranking in the military her grandfather was a master mason who had this incredible library that people would come from miles around to visit, you know, and she grew up right there in the heart of that. But Blavatsky had a lot of early tragedy. Her mother died uh, when she was 11 years old and the mother was only 29 or I think 28, 29 years old. So it's a very sh major shock to her early on. And um, she's incredibly hard to control as a youth <laughs> Uh, one of the incredible things we can say about Blavatsky is that she didn't like to be penned in by any rules at all. And so although she's incredibly talented uh, at school and in general, they've kind of had it. They're fed up with her. And the father gets it into his head after a little while to marry her off when she's 16. I actually dug up a picture of Blavatsky's mother who... Uh, was also a writer, and it's quite fascinating because her sister becomes one of the, the biggest writers in Russia. Um, but that is Helena Hahn, and that is Blavatsky's mother. And um, 
she she had some inkling that Helena was going to be something else, and she knew she was incredibly hard to control. Now, uh, from the mystery school point of view, this is something that came in directly from her past lives, and she was an incredibly talented medium and psychic who, according to Steiner, could go into the realms and into the mysteries through the spiritual worlds the way that they used to be able to do it through the Illusionian uh, mysteries of Greece. And that talent had been lost over time. And this is the one person who could do it. Is in fact, uh, the importance that Steiner placed on Blavatsky is quite interesting because one of the interesting things that he said about her is that the mystery schools knew by the astrology who had come in. So they followed her <laughs> via astrology. They knew what an extraordinary uh, person that they were dealing with here. What's interesting to me is that uh, Blavatsky herself decides, you know, when she's married off to this general Blavatsky, uh, that she's only 17 years old. And what she does after being with him for a couple of months is she says, I have to go visit my dad. And she takes off. <laughs> and what happens is Blavatsky disappears for eight years. So during that time, her mediumship awakens. She encounters the master's she goes, according to her own record, to the Himalayas, to Tibet, to Egypt, and to other places. What's interesting is where she went to school, which was Tiflis, which was also where Gurdjieff went to school. And I find that very interesting considering they're two of the major, major mystery school students who came out and changed the world. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X series 160. Whew, we're going into a Kashuk rewind. Atlantis, future past. What is it about Atlantis in our current period? What do we have in common here? I'm going to tell you. This is all about Edgar Casey, Helena Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, and Plato, and the Akashic record and how they read that and how that became the central tenet through which the mystery schools were able to put this all out to the public, bypassing all the censorship of thousands of years. We're going to be taking your questions in part two of tonight's program. Before we go any further, I want to mention that, especially if you're new here, you want to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. That's a free newsletter, and it keeps us in touch around this really incredible censorship that we've been experiencing. Um, it's a direct pipeline between you and I and lets you know of all the incredible stories and shows and interviews and events, documentaries that we have coming up for you uh, for the rest of the year and through 2024. So make sure you stand up and be counted and get that free newsletter before I go any further. Miss Olivia, how's the temperature out there? Good questions. Uh, Robert Scott said, is there a good mystery school that will actually see and fight against evil? I think the, yeah, the schools operate in the background. So you're not going to be able to look up a mystery school. <laughs> um, but the way that, that schools work, and you, know, you have to understand them as um, very secret organizations, and there's a reason for that. And Gurdjieff described the reason for that, which is the how to do and what to do and how to do it question. The what to do is all of these different things that are taught in various religious teachings turn the other cheek, and love your neighbor, all these, these various ideals. and But very often, that's, no one knows how to do that. <laughs> so there's a whole psychological training, psycho-emotional, psycho-spiritual training that goes along with that, and that's the part that's missing. So that's the how to do it. And that part stays underground because when it's up there in the surface, it gets persecuted by the leadership who sees it as a threat. And, you know, we see that story replay itself over and over again with different players. So think of it as an underground group. That's one. Then to see how the schools operate, you can think of them like this. There's the Central Mystery School, major. They call it the Great White Brotherhood. And, um, you know, brotherhood is kind of an anachronism because women are, you know, and priestesses are involved in it throughout history. So, you know, the the, the great group, as it were. But, um, and this is very interesting because um, when you go in and see how this operates, the next level down is something called lesser schools. And uh, I often say this is, I think, to make them get into this idea of kind of lowering the ego because they know so much. <laughs> 
there's nothing lesser about them. Um, but the lesser schools probably have about half the knowledge and are shy of that major initiation into the great mystery schools. And then you have arcane schools. And arcane schools just take the histories and the programs and the systems as they are, and they reenact them. So almost think of them as like, you know, the Civil War reenactment groups or um, the various groups that live in, uh, what do they call the one that's the Renaissance one? <laughs> but they, they have this whole thing that goes on where they start to live in that period and dress in that period and all the rest. Well, the arcane schools are exactly like that. And um, they live according to how things were laid out. So they don't seek to alter the rules to change or anything. They're just kind of living um, the straight up kind of uh, mystery knowledge. And um, so they preserve it in a great way. The, you could think of the arcane school as the greatest library that's available. And then the next level then are private study groups who are people that are interested in the ideas and uh, they develop a kind of a magnetic center. And that magnetic center draws them and attracts them to other people who are interested in those ideas. So, um, and then, so that, that's a private study group. And then there's the public study group, which is, you know, you see many of them, whether it's dealing uh, around things like uh, Elizabeth Clare Prophet's work or St. Germain or I Am, whatever the different things that have spawned off it. Of course, Alice Bailey's work was, you know, they had a number of public groups, the Gurdjieff groups, uh, the Bennett groups, all of those different mystery school groups have a public forum of some kind, you know, philosophy groups. You see them all over the place. And uh, that's the way to think of it. Public, private, arcane, lesser than the real thing. So when you're looking around trying to figure out, you know, where, how can I go to a mystery school? I think what they've done really is they put the, the information out there. And I uh, remember there's a conversation that takes place between Gurdjieff and Bennett where he asked them this exact question. And Gurdjieff says, you know, what they do is they come out and they spread these seeds. They don't really kind of incorporate into organizations. Uh, they come out for a little while and they show up in different sides of industry. Sometimes they show up in anything from entertainment to politics, or they might show up, you know, in a variety of capacities, uh, in labor, in development, in energy, you know, so they will show up in different levels of life. And I think that's the good way to think about it, which is they, they operate through a number of different things. And it was funny because, um, when Gurdjieff was giving information about his teachers, it, you know, everyone expected them to be in a cave system underground <laughs> in the mystery schools. And he was like, no, this guy was a police chief. This other guy was a construction engineer. You know, these are the, they're spread out throughout life in general. Um, and you will find at times different types of doorways open up, you know, I would say so that you run across these things. The, there's something really there about the whole kind of magnetic center. You got something else? No, not right now. Oh, very good. Well, very actually, good. I could ask this. Raz wanted to know, any idea how Helena Blavatsky supported herself for eight years of travel and education? You know, I've been looking into it. Nobody really knows about those eight years, including her sister, who I've studied her writings and letters very closely. And according to Blavatsky herself, and we know that she was a classically trained pianist. So when she goes to Egypt, she supports herself doing that. And she meets a magician there who introduces her to this um, brotherhood of Luxor, and they instantly recognize her psychic abilities. That's one of the keys. But both with Blavatsky and with Gurdjieff, they tend to hide how they got really introduced into the structure because that's part of the secrecy that has kept the structures able to operate in this underground fashion over time. So many of her stories, you know, at times you might say to yourself, well, you know, <laughs> she's leaving something out. And, um, but what I learned is that there were a number of people who came to her for her mediumistic abilities, even that young. And, um, later she would swear off mediumistic activity as kind of a lower way to get into this. And she said there were too many spirits or elementals and things that were tricksters and too many mediums who were suckers for it. So she decided let's go in a different direction. 
And there's a whole thing here about reincarnation that becomes important when we consider the Akashic record. But let's go a little bit deeper with Blavatsky. Um, Blavatsky, at the end of her life, she has written Isis Unveiled, and she has put out the sacred doctrine. The top people, like Steiner and Casey and others, when it comes to the work that she put out, they say, you know, it is entirely divine inspired. It comes directly from mystery knowledge, and there was nothing like it available. So in that sense, Blavatsky is extraordinary and an extraordinary person who sets off a chain reaction throughout the world of people attaining mystery. As a matter of fact, many of the things that theosophy brought forward are what we see today in terms of uh, you know meditation, yoga, uh, all these Eastern concepts brought in. What's interesting is uh, at a certain point, we find she's coming out and doing so much that she becomes a challenge to certain types of sacred societies that she doesn't, they don't want her revealing these things, you know, and she doesn't seem to appear to want to hold in any restraints in terms of the things that she knows. So we, we get into the situation with Blavatsky when we're observing her that by the time she gets to America, she's a challenge to the secret societies. And she, when she gets to America in 1875, realizes that the whole thing is run basically by um, left-hand mystery schools. And it's very interesting because that left and right-hand thing, uh, the right-hand generally, the way that it's described as far as the schools go, is that the right-hand schools are moving the culture forward. You know, they want to share the knowledge and they're trying to uh, have those things happen on a societal level. They're not forcing their way in. They're still trying to suggest ideas and have the culture pick up on it. Uh, the left-hand schools vary because um, a number of the schools are just selfish interest groups and other groups that are trying to attain wealth and power and things of this nature. But you have varying styles of those left-hand groups. So they're not all just off the charts negative. But on the really negative side on the left-hand path, you have the worst kind of people. Now, what's interesting is... Um, when you get into these schools and understanding what they're about, you start to realize just how much impact they have on a day-to-day -day life in terms of our political life, the media, and all the rest. So this influence you can trace directly, you know, everything that they're talking about back there kind of opens up this question because Steiner's another one who by the time, you know, he's talking about America in 1920, he says, good deal of the political process in America, like predominantly is run by these secret societies. That's crucial. He also talks about assassination as their tool of choice. And uh, we know they exercised it back in that period in the Russian Revolution and um, in the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, which Steiner goes into great detail to talk about the kind of occult makeup of that assassination. If Steiner had been around during the Kennedy assassination, he would have seen right through the kind of occult machinations that were uh, activated as a result of that. Now, um, with Blavatsky, just as a kind of a side thing, which is after she disappears for those eight years, on the family side, they, you know, the, the sister is gifted and a writer and has all these intellectuals in, and she's having these parties, and Blavatsky just shows up one day out of the blue after eight years. And the sister writes about it, and she talks about how extraordinarily changed that Blavatsky is and that Blavatsky has awakened to all of her abilities. Now, the, the sister said she was always unusual and she was always gifted, but she, when she came back, she was psychically gifted and it seemed like there were things that followed her around. So there's all kinds of poltergeist type activity around her. Uh, she had the ability to predict things. She drew people to her and there were a variety of kind of like ghostly type things that happened. In relation to her, uh, there's no question that there's so many different versions of this story with Blavatsky that we can see in her auric field once she had gone into the schools and had been awakened to these uh, kind of spiritualistic tendencies, she came back as a fully different person. So the sister is describing who she was when she came back, and she said, you know, as it so happened, she was getting so much attention in our city where we were living that 
we decided we, we better get her out of town here because <laughs> she's becoming like a celebrity. You know, people are hanging out outside the house trying to get a, a peek in the window at her. So um, they move, and it's very interesting because the place that they move to is very close to Voronezh. Now, it's interesting because the family's from Ukraine, and uh, they have, you know, family that spreads out directly there into Voronezh in Russia. Voronezh will become the scene in 1989 of the most incredible UFO sighting in Russian history where these crafts land, these beings land. So the addition in her history tab, as it were, of this very unusual facet of her visiting um, and going to live very close to this Voronezh region, I found interesting. And what happens when she gets there um, is also interesting because she instantly experiences the people who were there and she has this kind of spiritually in tune piece. So she goes and she sees all these ghosts and she recognizes their names and all the rest. And she goes out and tells the different neighbors about it. And they're like, yeah, that was, you know, Hunter who used to live in, in this building and in this house and his whole family. And they're amazed that she's interacting with these ghosts. And so again, the word spreads about how remarkable her talent is. Well, it just so happens that there's a serial killer loose at that time. So the police come to Blavatsky and they're like, can you help us, you know, with these cases? And suddenly she's got a full-time job being the police psychic. And she does in fact track down these different criminals for them. So she's one of the first psychic detectives, I guess you could mm -hmm. say. Um, so the sister, uh, again, it's, it's turning into like a weird celebrity household and the sister goes to visit the dad and, um, Blavatsky is writing letters back and forth. And it's interesting because one of the things that she says, she's starting to realize that, you know, she's going to have to bring the teaching that she learned over those eight years forward. And here's what she wrote to her sister in that period of time after the sister went back home. Quote, humanity has lost its faith in its higher ideals. Materialism and science have slain them. The children of this age have no longer faith. They demand proof, proof founded on a scientific basis, and they shall have it. Theosophy, the source of all human religions, will give it to them. Soon all her letters were full of arguments against the abuse of spiritism, which she termed spiritual materialism, or indignation against mediumistic seances where the dead were evoked, the materializations of the dear departed, the dwellers in the land of eternal spring or summer land who, in her opinion, were nothing more than shades, elves, and lying elementals, often dangerous, and above all, evil in their effects on the health of the unfortunate mediums, their passive victims. Later, her visit to the Brothers Eddie, a well-known medium uh, household in Vermont, was the last drop which made her cup run over. She became from thenceforward the deadly enemy of all demonstrative spiritualism. This is very interesting because in the eight years where she was supporting herself, Supposedly, she was one of the best mediums anywhere. <laughs> um, but something happened with this process where the original brotherhoods that came out um, and decided we want to share this with humanity, they decided, you know what, um, what's happening is very interesting because a number of these mediums are saying, hey, our relatives after they die are living in an exact environment of earth. And, you know, basically when you go and you die, heaven is just like earth. And this is exactly what they didn't want. <laughs> and uh, so we're in a weird situation there with the early setup of the mystery schools rolling this out. So it seems like Blavatsky has to turn against the thing that she's actually quite good at. But also she was seeing this process of mediumship as something that, unless it was very well protected going in, could be easily become this occult playground for all sorts of things that wanted to get in and masquerade as the loved ones of these people who'd gone into the hereafter. So that was the end of her career as a spiritualist, and she would, in fact, turn against it when she created the Theosophical Society. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is a Kashuk Rewind. Atlantis, Future Past, Casey, Steiner, Blavatsky, and Plato. Visions? of Atlantis, deep, deep in the subconscious, and how those mystery schools brought forward a message for the 21st century. We're going to be taking your questions here in just a little bit as I get through the various characters that we have who um, 
figures in history that I think are still not quite understood. And uh, I think that we're, we're ready now to understand the message that they brought through and also experience the kind of uh, renaissance and next phase of the work of these mysteries. We're going to take your questions, but before I go any further, Miss Olivia, what do you got? Okay. MK wants to know, do the Tibet or India or Egypt official sources like newspapers at that time have proof of her being there, or is it just Blavatsky's story slash personal letters? And Nenna says again, I wonder if Blavatsky spent, spent those years living as a man, a monk, or something which made her so different from ah. her peers. Well, you really tapped into something there because when she comes to America, the mystery schools that are here, um, they say she demands to be, <laughs> you know, she says, I already know the secrets that you guys know, so let me in and we can work together. And um, they say, well, we don't admit women, the particular group she was dealing with. There were groups that did admit women. And uh, so they instantly have a block there. The other thing that they accuse her of, totally unfounded fashion, is of being a Russian spy. So she's a woman and she's a Russian. And um, inside of those schools, Steiner makes a very interesting um, observation. He says, the thing that was tossed around about how to handle Blavatsky was to saying that she was violating the Constitution. So whatever it is they had up their sleeve, they wanted her, you know, on some kind of federal charge to get out of America. <laughs> and um, I think it's very interesting when you think about the control period, because the control is not so tightly wound. You have the Rockefellers in that period. You have J.P. Morgan, uh, who shows up shortly thereafter and, and really becomes a dominant force. But America isn't so woundly uh, kind of tied up. So what we have, I think, is this kind of major challenge that she represents. And so what they decide to do with her, to make a long story short, is to interfere with what she's doing. So first, she puts out, after spending you know, a long time, six months, in her apartment in New York, and really just barely getting by. I mean, this is not somebody who lived the high life, even though she came from a, a very well-to-do family and uh, a well-established family. The family name over there was pretty major, um, as the sister informs us all about that history. The other part of your question is interesting, is how, how much proof do we have of her in these travels in those eight years? I will say this about Blavatsky, which is Henry Alcott, who became her partner in theosophy, uh, was very curious about her background. And after, during, while she was alive and after she died, continued to investigate that background the same way that Ospensky and Bennett investigated Gurdjieff's background. They wanted to know, where do those schools come in? Where were they exactly? And um, in Gurdjieff's case, it appears that at least one of the schools that he was associated with was in Afghanistan. And um, in terms of Blavatsky, it looks like where she really got her major mystical training was in Cairo. Now, Alcott went back and found extraordinary stories from different people seeing her in this period over time. And there's an official military story um, of these English, uh, British occupiers of India saying that there's a woman who is spending time in the Himalayas and she's basically looking for this monastery and we don't know what to do with her and she's, you know, she's from Russia and things like that. So there are threads backing up uh, the fact that she was out there. The fact that people like Steiner and like Besant and others who really became, I mean, uh, she had died by the time Steiner really got rolling, but Besant was her direct disciple. Those people understood immediately the value of uh, the books that she had brought forward. So when Isis Unveiled comes out, it's an earthquake because it reveals all of these different levels of humanity, and it gives us uh, a number of things like the Atlantis story, and it gives us all the, the kind of ages past understanding and where humanity is going and how we interact with angels. I mean, it's such an incredible book. And um, by the time she gets to the secret doctrine, it's interesting because that also, you know, it comes out 10 years later, and it, it also is a different kind of an earthquake, and it's sort of her... Uh, passing you know, opus because she will die just a couple of years after that. But those two books, and there are other books in between, but those are really 
her masterpieces. And the people who know the esoteric world best and understand the mystery schools best, you know, swear by the information that's in those books and say it wasn't anywhere. And um, when you read them, you can see they're very unusual. And if you look at them in terms of the context of the time that they're in, they're so mysterious. Uh, as all of these characters in a way are, I mean, Rudolf Steiner's work is absolutely, there's nothing like it except theosophy. <laughs> but when he breaks off and he gets into Araman and the Eighth Sphere, there's nobody teaching anything like that. And then when you get to Casey, he's giving us such a vivid picture from the Akashic record of Atlantis. Where else are you going to get that? You will get mentions in the Steiner work and in theosophy and in different studies about Atlantis, but you'll never get anything about this incredibly high tech culture. And here's Casey talking in the 1920s about this thing. And it sounds like science fiction <laughs> uh, because he's saying, look, you know, the Atlanteans possessed this Chuai stone. They used it as a power station. This is what they used. And they had ships that could go anywhere. They had planes. They had advanced. They had ships that could fly through mountains, never mind over mountains. <laughs> so what kind of technology are we talking about there? So again, we're getting in very uh, deep place. What I think is interesting about all of these different mystery schools that became public is they go directly to the individual level. So yeah, they have fantastic stories about Atlantis and the beginnings of humanity and all of these different things, karma, reincarnation, the Akashic record, but they always go back to the individual. How are you dealing with this information? And um, this becomes important because they're about self-improvement on a level of spiritual development in a way that you just don't see. And what's happening there is there's the religious doctrine that's hanging on, but is becoming very rote and, you know, very mechanical in a sense. And then there's the scientific materialism creeping in saying, you don't need religion, just whatever you can weigh or measure. And that's the real danger that's happening in the period where these schools decide we're going to let this information out. And there are consequences to letting the information out. You don't know <laughs> what's going to happen when you let a bunch of secret information out to the public. But we're going to get into how that became this incredible awakening and how that awakening was tr consistently rebuffed and suppressed by the establishment. We're going to be uh, diving into that and then taking your questions. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is Akashic Rewind, Atlantis Future Past, Casey Steiner, and Blavatsky, Visions of Plato and Atlantis. We're going to be taking your questions here uh, in about a half hour. Before we go to that, Miss Olivia, you're up. Uh, W.C. Ray wants to know, did Madame Blavatsky ever hang out with Rasputin? And Fred D. said, how large was Theosophy's influence in that era? Well, what's interesting is it became massive in America and in England. And then they brought it to India and it became very huge there. But she was harassed when she got to India. So there was a structure there that didn't want this competition, you could say. Um, and I would say it's remarkable, basically, um, after ISIS unveiled, there's a huge earthquake uh, of, you know, a tidal wave of supporters. And I think it was really the UK and the US that got her off the ground. Uh, very interesting, of course, the original logo of Theosophy and you'll notice right in the middle of it there is the swastika, which wasn't called the swastika then and has nothing to do with the kind of racial politics that went on with the Nazis. But the Nazis would adopt these different occult symbols, as we know, and they grab this one, but you can see the ex embedded inside of it. Of course, at this point, it was known as the heart of Buddha or the sun. Uh, there's certain runes that are associated with it. So the symbol itself is quite important. Um, this snake eating its own tail is a motif that you find as far away in America as Ohio with the serpent mound. And that's an Atlantean symbol. You have something here that resembles the Star of David, but you've got the Ankh, Egyptian Ankh in the middle of it, and then a Buddhist sign for peace on the top. And uh, the theme was there is no higher truth there is no higher religion than truth. That's the, the theme of theosophy. 
So, you know, you can't argue with that. <laughs> Did you ever answer the question about Rasputin? Oh, uh, Rasputin came later. So Rasputin is around with the czars. And, um, you know, so he's around, let's say, from 1908 to 1915, I believe, 1916. And uh, Blavatsky dies now in 1890. Too um, bad. Yeah. <laughs> Just picturing yeah. them together is very entertaining. Yeah, it's interesting. But um, Rasputin was a contemporary of Gurdjieff. And there were people in the court of the czars who wanted to get Gurdjieff in there as to kind of head off Rasputin. So Rasputin is very interesting and uh, somebody that we'll, we'll get into in another story in another show. But uh, the intrigue there that's so interesting is these people, the czars, understood very, very well. And you'll find this in Russia generally. There's a great understanding about the importance of uh, the psychic, etheric side of things. And it's interesting, in, um, in Steiner's work, uh, Rudolf Steiner with Anthroposophy. And of course, he's the Austrian mystic that gives us spiritual science. But he, he was with theosophy for a decade first. So, you know, he gives them props and all the rest. But then he has to break off because once Blavatsky, uh, after Blavatsky dies, there's, you know, he, he doesn't join up till 1901. So that's 10 years after she died, but still the glow of her work was there. Once um, Besant takes over, there's too many people who are pulling at Besant to do different things. And um, Besant, who's the disciple of Blavatsky, is very interesting in her own right. And we've covered her on a few programs. One thing I will say about Besant, which is she was very politically active. And she's the one who tries to get home rule for Ireland and achieves home rule for India. So this is, you know, not somebody who hangs out uh, <laughs> thinking Zen thoughts and gets out of touch with the world. She's very active. And it's interesting because it appears that a number of forces try to manipulate her. And Steiner at a certain point says, you know, she's so manipulated and the whole movement has been manipulated that it's all about these um, German philosophers and these Hindus trying to infiltrate. And whoever those groups were, they were successful and they would ultimately destroy that version of theosophy, trying to use it as a political tool. Very interesting indeed. Yes, great questions out there in the ideas room tonight. And uh, I look forward to more as we go here. Let's now just jump briefly to the ascended masters. And then uh, I want to go from there to the Casey work. So um, the ascended masters are something that Theosophy identified and they work directly with Blavatsky. So basically these are uh, human beings who, you know, lived in such a way that they were able to become a powerful force, almost like saints in a way. And they became something operating in the background, trying to move the world forward spiritually. Um, she worked with a, an artist, and he, he actually was someone who did these incredible portraits of the royal family. How, but he was a theosophist. So she said, well, you know, can you capture, let's see if I can relate the masters that I'm dealing with to you and see who you can capture. So what we have here is uh, Kutumi, is the one of the main ascended masters. The um, the artist is Herman Schmieker, and here is uh, Moria. So it's interesting because this becomes the teacher. That's Blavatsky's master who follows her around and appears and reappears out of nowhere. Now it's very interesting because um, what happens with uh, Edgar Casey throughout his life this figure in a turban shows up over and over again and guides him through different moments. And it's very unusual when he shows up because, you know, Casey's in the American South and you don't see a lot of guys with turbans, especially in that era, walking around. Um, so there's something there, this hand of these brotherhoods, they seem to have this identification. And uh, I think that the master story is quite interesting. Now, what happens 
is you get into a free for all after Blavatsky and all these people are suddenly like, Oh, I'm channeling, you know, um, these different masters and things of that nature. So, um, that's all, you know, well and good. But I think what we're trying to stick to is that it appears that these masters at a certain point were trying to use Blavatsky and Henry Alcott. And Alcott's the other enigma here who helps her found theosophy. He is a general and he's retired. And um, he was a general in Lincoln's army with a very kind of crucial, um, respectable background, but he was very interested. Once he was retired, he became very interested in spiritualism and he wrote a series of articles for all the New York newspapers. That's how she tracked him down. And when they meet, they meet at that Eddie house where all this fantastic, uh, it's a farmhouse in Vermont. And I've, I've actually, uh, I've never been in it, but I've driven by there. <laughs> and um, what's interesting is what was going on there sounded like incredible uh, mediumistic activity and people would come in from different cities to see what was happening while well, she went there knowing he was going to be there. And, uh, he describes the whole story of meeting her and it's this incredible meeting. And, uh, she speaks with broken Russian rolls her own cigarettes and is generally kind of gruff <laughs> in her exterior. So she's different from any woman in that period. Um, and instantly they become buddies in a sense. And they decide very shortly after that to form the Theosophical Society. And a number of unusual things happen, uh, which are all recorded in a series of books called Old Diary Leaves that Henry Alcott wrote at the end of uh, his life about theosophy. And they are incredible stories, including the fact that at one point you, these men come looking for Blavatsky and they're very strange. And he figures out later that they're connected with this uh, Brotherhood of Luxor. But um, when they were outside, he noticed that it was, it was raining when he was looking at them. And when they came inside looking for her into this apartment, it started to rain in the apartment. <laughs> so uh, they had strange control over nature, and uh, there's all sorts of strange things happening there. A lot of the stories, he talks about her manifesting things that weren't there whether it was food like bananas or money or objects, whatever it happened to be. So she had the ability to uh, kind of materialize things. Did That's you tell pretty the, extraordinary. Did you tell the fairy gold story? Oh, the fairy gold is interesting. Um, this is a term that she mentioned to uh, Olcott. And when they would go to certain places like go to India, they would go sometimes with absolutely no money. <laughs> And uh, he knew that he was on this track and that he had found this incredible partner to do it with. Um, and they, you know, they had the only kind of relationship they had was friendship. Um, but he knew that they were going to build this incredible structure. And he had a lot of unusual psychic experiences himself. But uh, he said, what are we going to do? You know, basically, we're here. There's no money or whatever. And she said, don't worry. You know, there's fairy gold coming in. And she would wake up and there would be gold, you know, in her bed. And um, then other things would happen. They'd be at dinner with their last, you know, a uh, few dollars there in Bombay or somewhere. And then a check would come to the table and it would be, you know, 23,000 pounds from someone who admires her work from afar. Or Just these incredible things. And so there's that signal in the background that something is moving them along and moving her story along. And I have to say that um, her sister, who's very interesting, and I have a shot of uh, her with her sister, and I was very interested to read her point of view because she, like the dad, is a very down-to-earth person and didn't want to believe in all the psychic aspects. And she still didn't think, you know, she was like, you know, I, I don't know about Ascended Masters, and I don't know if my sister was, you know, leading the world, but she was an extraordinary woman, and all this psychic activity did take place around her. So she's kind of like, you know, she balances the story out in an interesting way. That's, I think, the only shot of the sister with Blavatsky. And um, they have this extraordinary life. That's all cut up there. And I think that we get a sense there, that's just a few years before Blavatsky died, everyone around Blavatsky said that she had this incredible, you know, she was kind of carrying this cross of trying to bring this message out for humanity. And, um, you know, she could be 
she had fits of anger and <laughs> there's all kinds of stories about her. Um, you know, at, at a certain point, all caught himself meets these ascended masters. And he says, you know, in his interactions with them, he's like, you know, couldn't you have worked on her personality a little bit? Like she's, she's really made things difficult for me. And they're basically like, you know, that's, that's how she needs to be. And this is who she is. And, um, you know, however imperfect you think she is, like she, she's what we got, you know, we're working with her. Um, there's oh, a, there's, I'm going to throw in something here. Oh, yeah. Like anybody who's ever known any psychics, um, usually I'm going to just put it out there. They tend to be, I, the ones I've known, they tend to be a little heavy. They're indulgent physically mm. They're And, uh, they sm often smoke <laughs> and drink and things like this. And I just think it's this, it's the nature of needing to weigh themselves <laughs> down on the earth plane because otherwise uh, they just get too airy and just float up. That is very interesting indeed. Um, I can definitely see that. Well, it's interesting because Olcott tries to dig into that past um, of Blavatsky. And I'll read two quick things from his old diary leaves here. And then uh, we'll go into the KC part. And then uh, we'll be able to take your questions. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Deep, deep tonight, Akashic Rewind, Atlantis, Future Past. I'm going to read some KC uh, readings on the Akashic Record put us on track there. And of course, Casey Steiner and Plato Blavatsky visions. Okay. So here's what Olcott has to say in relation to her personality and various failings, etc. There was another and supreme reason why the masters dare not control and compel Blavatsky's innate character to be softened and refined into the higher ideal of a benevolent and gentle sage, independently of her own volition. To do so would have been an unlawful interference with her personal karma. As I may now express it, like every other human being she represented as she was then, a certain personal equation, the fruit of a certain evolutionary progress of her entity. It was its karma to have been born in this time at just such a tumultuous female body and to have the chances thus offered to gain spiritual progress in a lifelong combat against its hereditary passions. To have interfered with that by benumbing the violent temper and suppressing her other personal defects of character would have been a <laughs> grievous wrong to her without hastening her evolution one whit. It would have been something like keeping a hypnotic sensitive perpetually under the hypnotizer's will or an invalid permanently stupefied by a narcotic. Um. Now, it's interesting, too, because if you look into the Casey readings, the, the readings themselves have kind of a, <laughs> yeah, they have an impression of Casey where they, you know, they're really chopping away at his ego all the time. And so they, they're like, one of the reasons that we work with this lowly, weak, unworthy channel is because he wants to do something good for humanity, you know. But over and over again, there's this intimation that the people are just, they're just people. And, um, you know, some better, some are worse. I'm you know, when it comes to Steiner, you don't hear a lot of stories about him raging against people or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, with Blavatsky, you do. You definitely do. And that's this kind of, you know, temperament that she had. But it makes her stand out rather dramatically, I think, um, as this contrast in a really a complex uh, figure in this sense. Now, another uh, kind of interesting story that I had here was that she was also mentioned in old diary leaves somebody had remembered her that olcott came across and said oh you know um we were on this kind of safari and we'd heard about this woman who was giving these mediumistic trances and um she was able to when we found this building with these very unusual ancient carvings on it she was able to basically um, do a ritual at it to allow them to see what it was when it was whole and what it represented. So she kind of brought them into the Akashic record. I found that as an unusual, uh, quite remarkable testimony to her unusual gifts. Um, and, you know, when we get into it, speaking of unusual gifts, we're going to get into Edgar Casey's work. And it's fascinating because when we look at this progression here, these people have a lot in common. Blavatsky, Gurdjieff, 
Casey and Steiner, when they're young, all have experiences of seeing those who have passed on. So that veil is lifted for them very young. They encounter ghosts at a very young age. Um, and it's interesting with Steiner because it troubles him because he sees a woman who keeps disappearing into a stove. And um, he tells his parents about it, and he's trying to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> he's only a 10-year-old boy. And he has conversations with this woman. He's like, I, I think that she's real, and then she disappears into the stove. And they find out that she was an aunt of Steiner's who died and killed herself, basically. And uh, so she's appearing to him. In, in Edgar Casey's work, it's quite fascinating because his grandfather, who had the ability to do things like move tables, and move objects, so he had this unusual psychokinesis to him. Um, he was very close with the grandfather, and when he's five years old, the grandfather goes to give the horse a drink and in a very kind of shallow pool of water, and uh, the horse throws him, and he drowns. And Casey is a five-year-old kid and can't save him. So that always kind of traumatized him going forward as a youth. But what happens is he starts to talk to the parents and say, I can see, I still talk to, you know, grandpa. And he's, he's still there. He's still telling me about things. And he says, well, I've moved on to this other plane, but I don't want you to be sad and all these kind of afterlife thoughts. So he has that experience. And uh, when you go right down the line, it's interesting because Gurdjieff has an experience where he and another military boy they have a near-death experience by being near an explosion. And after that, Gurdjieff kind of gets, you know, he's he's a young, he's like 11 years old, and he starts to think, wait a minute, what happens in life after death? What, you know, that's what sets him off. So there's a lot of very telling experiences that a number of these people share in common. And of course, Blavatsky seemed like she was surrounded by poltergeist and ghost activity even when she was very young. So there's something about that, that veil being lifted. And um, I think in the, you know, with Casey forever, throughout his whole life, he ex continued to experience this when, you know, um, there was a guy named Dr. House, Dr. Thomas House, who helped him set up the Casey Hospital, and then he passed away, and then he would come back and tell him, look, you know, you need to do this, this, and this to make it work right. And Casey's engaging with Dr. House, who's completely passed away. So this extra level that they're on, they come in already before they take any kind of teaching or have any kind of master working with them. They already seem to have this ability. And um, a number of people that I've met who are psychic seem to have, you know, they, they have this ability to tune into the afterlife or ghosts or things of this nature. So it seems like they're, they're brought in with it, as it were. Um, so Casey now is giving us information about the Akashic Record, and I find his descriptions um, the most fruitful. It's interesting because Blavatsky talks all about the Akashic Record, but she calls it the Astral Light Chronicle. Ooh. Um, so. And she compares it to these very interesting photographs that are going on in that period because I guess photographs weren't quite uh, they they weren't quite known as photographs at the time. And uh, I had one here of Abe Lincoln, but I'll find it before we're done today. In any case, um, Casey at a certain point when talking about the Akashic Record says. Plato, different individuals in history could read the Akashic Record. Plato could read it. And then I started to think, well, you know, it's fascinating when you think about it because Plato gives us the story of Atlantis and he gets it from uh, Solon. And then Solon gets it from an Egyptian priest. So the story comes from Egypt. But then I started to wonder, you know, can Plato even talk about the fact that he can access the Akashic Record? And how far into Atlantis history, where he gets this incredible story, how much of that is drawn directly from the Akashic Record? And I'm going to give a good description of that Akashic Record, but I'm going to do the order a little upside down. I'm going to give you just a little pinch 
of that Plato story about Atlantis. And uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X series. This is X series 160, Akashic Rewind, Atlantis, Future Past, Casey Steiner, and Plato Visions. This is what set us off on this trap of learning about Atlantis and all the various things that become this incredible whirlwind of uh, activity around the subject matter for humanity to learn all about its own history. And this track, I think, is particularly important because it leads, it opens up when they're giving us all this information through the schools in the 19th century, it opens up the entire subject about Atlantis. Before that, there wasn't that much talk about it. And this is something, obviously, that we were meant to learn and re-experience to understand we're coming into a similar phase like this again. So the trouble that took place back in Atlantean times of them destroying themselves with technology is befalling humanity again, or there's a different way to handle it using this kind of cosmic memory, as Steiner called it. So here's what he says. Let me begin by observing, first of all, that 9,000 was the sum of years which had elapsed since the war was said to have taken place between all those who dwelt outside the pillars of Hercules and those who dwelt within them. Now that's the rock of Gibraltar uh, in that period that goes out to the Atlantic Ocean. And so when Plato is getting this story now, it's around 400 BC. So when he's saying that this is 9,000 years, that's basically 9,400 BC we're talking about. Uh, and he says, between all those who dwelt outside the pillars of Hercules and those who dwelt within them. So basically the Greeks, the Egyptians, and all these others versus the Atlanteans who had superior numbers, superior technology, and took over. He says, I am now about to describe that war. Of the combatants on the one side, the city of Athens was reported to have been the ruler and to have directed the contest. The combatants on the other side were led by the king's of the islands of Atlantis, which I was saying once had an extent greater than that of Libya and Asia, and then afterwards was sunk by an earthquake, then an impassable barrier of mud to voyagers sailing from hence to the ocean. The progress of history I will unfold the various tribes, the barbarians, the Hellenes, which then existed, which they successfully appear on the scene, but I must begin by describing first of all the Athenians, as they were in that day, and their enemies who fought them. And I shall have to tell you the power and form of government of both of them. Let us give the pre precedence to Athens. Many great deluges have taken place during the 9,000 years, for that is the number of years that have elapsed since the time of which I am speaking. And in all the ages, all the changes, others, he made princes and gave them rule over many a large territory. Um, Things have never been any sediment of the earth flowing down from the mountain as in other places. It has always been carried round in a circle and disappeared in the depths below. The consequence is that in comparison of what then was the remaining of small islands, only the bones of the wasted body as may be called. The translation there is as Atlantis was destroyed, there were vestiges, there were islands, there were pieces of it that were still up there. And the groups would migrate to the islands, but then there were still earthquakes going on. So these groups were then migrating and coming in as hostile uh, immigrants, as it were, to Greece, to Egypt, and to other places. But he has them coming in 9400 BC. This is quite extraordinary. What's interesting to me when we get around Plato's um, whole story, and this is kind of the most fascinating part, is that he's basically talking about how warlike the Egyptians are. Now, Casey's story is that there's two groups. There's the Belial group and there's the Amelius group. And the Amelius group have this advanced technology through the two-eye stone, and they use it for attuning to what Casey calls the saintly realm, the outer spheres. And um, the Belial group imitates them. So the Belial group doesn't have a lot to bring to the table, spiritually or intellectually but they're very good imitators. And they imitate the Amelius group in the number of things that they do, and they decide to take the 2 eye technology over time and exercise it, not to connect with any kind of spiritual deity, but to develop weapons and superior technology with it. So this group that's coming in that's being described by Plato is actually more than just a seafaring war tribe. 
they actually are the inheritors of this dangerous technology that they've used. And, you know, somewhere in that tale, Plato says, well, they angered the gods. Well, and then they disappeared in a day and a night in a series of earthquakes. Um, angering the gods has that ring to it, just like the Tower of Babel story. So um, we're getting kind of a hint there of what was going on and who these groups were. Now, keep in mind the Belial group shows up over and over again in the Casey work as this destructive group, might makes right. And what they do is they develop a group of slave armies that are made up of clones. And um, this is a very strange piece that Casey brings forward if you can penetrate the language that he's using as well. They're basically the Atlantean scientists are bringing forward androids to invade these other territories. Casey will use the term automaton, which basically means robot in that period. Um, and the automatons are interesting because Casey will say that, you know, well, they're using them as artisans. They're using them as workers in the field. They're using them as armies. Um, and when we look at it now and we see the kind of incredible development that we have with AI and all the incredible things <laughs> that we have up our sleeve for doing that, we need to take a moment and reflect on the incredible advances of Casey's story and how pertinent it is for the period that we're in, how it's almost designed more for this period. And it's fascinating too, because Casey is using the language, you know, if he said, well, they developed their own cyborgs, they wouldn't have understood it. Uh, in 1930. But when he said automaton, that's what he's talking about. Those were automatons. This is what he's referring to. Uh, and this is what they had in that period of time. They were just developing robots. They just had the themes down and they could make them do little things like, you know, I'll get this one to play the piano or whatever. These are the automatons and Casey in the readings is calling them um automaton by name to try to connect them with what's going on now. The other thing that he's doing is he says the, the Atlanteans refer to them as things. So they are, you know, untouchables. They are oof because what's happened when they made them cyborgs, they're not pure machines. They have a human part mixed and sometimes animal parts mixed. So they're a strange aberration in the evolutionary chain that the Atlantean scientists through a Belial group have developed. This is kind of an incredible area that no one in the Casey work was prepared to do anything with, but it kept coming up. And if you go to the Casey um, Center now, you know, in general, they've kind of forgotten how to talk about the Atlantean part. <laughs> and it is controversial. And I think that they want to stick with the holistic aspect. But the truth is, Casey talked endlessly. He had 900 readings about Atlantis. So you have to deal with it if you want to deal with Casey's work. And sometimes you'll find some of the officials from the Casey Foundation said, well, maybe he wasn't, you know, maybe his mind slipped on that because we don't know anything about that. It is the power and the center of the Casey work to find out about his Atlantis readings, the technology, the two eye stone, and the automatons. This is what Casey was giving us. And I'm going to read from uh, some of those readings to give us an idea of that now. And then we'll take your questions after that. How's that? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show, Akashic Rewind. Here comes the Akashic Record aspect, Atlantis, Future Past, Casey, Blavatsky, Steiner, and Plato Visions. Uh, do you have something for me? I do. Uh, I wanted to pair it with something. <laughs> Hang on a second. Uh, let me just ask, Happy Camper earlier said, Musk thinks we're all going to be hooked up to a complete AI whole brain interface if society survives the next 25 years. <laughs> well, Musk, does Musk think that or does DARPA think that? You know, it gets very tricky. When you get to that point where you're being used, everything that you say is operated by a committee. So um, I think whenever he actually does speak his mind. The, well, the is he ex-share? I mean, is this is he letting us know what is planned behind the scenes? No, he's mm -hmm. not ex-share. Okay. Musk, but I understand what you mean. The mm -hmm. question is right on. But he is definitely, um, you know, it's interesting because they've brought forward, and we've 
from the very beginning of this show with X Degonography, we've told you what they're doing, bringing forward the X technology. We've told you through steganography and said, here's what the steganography is about and all the rest. Then Musk, when he gets in charge of Twitter, you know, after ballooning out uh, SpaceX and everything else, then he turns, he wants to turn it into X and he does. And then he wants to turn it into the everything app. So they are communicating that they're using the X technology to bring us down this road. So it becomes very significant, actually, the point that you made there. But um, they've positioned him as a kind of a freedom fighter. And, you know, they had all those pictures of him hugging the Constitution and stuff. But um, when you get up at that point, you're dealing, you know, he can't operate at all without the defense contractors and the U.S. government military in space. And they just want that control of the space grid. So Musk is in that system. And I think whenever he says something that's not in line with what they want to do, you do see, you know, the stock goes down 4 billion or whatever. And, you know, I think he shoots his mouth off once in a while, but in general, I'd say you're looking at a committee running someone very much like a Howard Hughes type situation. And um, he's maintained the facade of being a free speech guy. But if you actually, and there, there have been improvements on Twitter, there's no question about it remarkable improvements but uh you know this is somebody who's running an organization that wants to put an ai chip in your head <laughs> so unfortunately no you know um but it, it, he is a man of his time as it were so he's he's somebody who's right on time in terms of the the kind of technology he's putting out there uh i also think that the um Starlink satellites are an incredible hazard. And I'll go more into that as we go along. Um, here's Casey talking about the Akashic records, what they are, so we can get at some hint of what he's talking about. Yes, we have the information as given. We find the record that is built by this entity in the Akashian record is to the mental world as the cinema is to the material or physical world as pictured in its activity. So in the direction of an entity and its entrance into the material plane in a given period, time and place, which indicate the relative position of the entity as related to the universe or universal sources, then one only turns, as it were, to those records of the Akashian forms to read that period of what was builded or lost during that experience. So Casey here is saying, look, I have your records here in front of me. Here's how I got them. You asked for a life reading and I'm going out of body to this Akashic record, this storehouse written upon the skeins of time and space. And I am interpreting what I see here in your record. So um, at times Casey will describe the process as seeing himself as a light outside of his body. And then he's traveling and the images are kind of both good and bad on either side of them. Some of them are horrible images, but he gets past that and he starts to see what look like normal cities. And then he sees a, an incredible kind of well-lit uh, area, a building, and then he gets to it and he arrives very suddenly at this hall of records. And then an individual comes to him and hands him the book for the individual that he is seeking the information on and he reads it. This is Casey's experience of getting his hands on that Akashic record. Um, but he's saying that everything that this person has done in their different lifetimes is written, it's literally written on the ether so he can go and interpret it. Um, let's find out a little bit about this and then kind of link it back into the Atlantean experience. Um, so he says, well, in the development of this entity, there are conditions that are worthy of note for those that study the phase of man development, man's development that relates to the Kashic record, as is made by each individual as an individual, and the effect that same has on the continuity of existence as related to Earth's experience and of the astrological relations in the Earth. For while there are urges in the earthly experience, there is ever that factor to be dealt with and accounted for in man's individuality called will. 
as to how this may shape, mold, or change various experiences. So he's saying, look, the first thing that we have here is your records. And the way I'm able to access them is through this Akashic record. This is the record of all your experience, all the things that you've done. Then he's saying, in terms of your future, you know, we have all these influences from your past lives. We have these astrological influences. But let me tell you, the number one thing driving all of this is your will. What happens with your will? That's your real spiritual test. So all this other stuff is interesting and it's good to know the influences, et cetera, but nothing is going to surpass your will when it comes right down to it. So he's still going for the free will zone. Um, next. Um, so there's a woman that comes to him and she's very interested in using what she calls etheric devices. So she's, uh, it's almost like, uh, what were we talking about? We said it was kind of like a Rife machine, right? Mm -hmm. And she wants to do this vibrational healing and she's mechanically gifted. She had a lifetime in Atlantis. And Casey tells her, yeah, you've got your finger on the pulse here. Like this will be the wave of the future at some point using this ether, etheronic energy for healing. And uh, the woman is extraordinary herself, and she's a theosophist, interestingly enough. So um, she asked this question, which I find very interesting, and it gets to the point about the Akashic Records and the ability of, for us to read them. And she said, as given through this channel, we understand the Akashic Records are recorded on the ether. Then cannot an instrument be invented to induct ether and thus tap into the Akashic records? Casey said, yes, but this would be induction or rolling back, while this, in this particular instrument here, is rolling out or taking that in the present activity and giving out. But it would necess necessitate rather a varied or different form, but using much the same theory as is used or shown here in the activity of this healing machine. Yet, this may be done. In fact, it eventually will be done. So somebody, Casey is saying here, is going to build a machine that's going to read the Akashic records. <laughs> so, you know, you tune it in to a particular period of time, you know, Akhenaten or, uh, you know, Leonardo, whatever it happens to be, and there you are. So that's quite remarkable. And it's, it's a kind of a standalone reading. There's a couple of readings with this woman and her device, but the machine for reading the Akashic Records for me, is, you know, this is something left on the cutting room floor. And well, he's, he's looking ahead and saying, yeah, they're going to do it eventually. Or have they done it with our missing trillions? Yes, exactly. Well, think about what they would do with it. That's the incredible exactly. thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, if you wanted to target people, knowing their past lives... I mean, their weakness. I mean, this could be very useful. Um, the follow-up reading on that, the woman herself is interested in that. She says, can you tell me where the instrument that she's using, this etheronic device, for tuning into the Akashic records would differ from the one we have here? And he says, one we have here, we are drawing from influences, or that influences upon an individual activity separated from the whole yet subject to it. See, while the Akashic records, that is the going out or passing out into the records. See, one is going out, one, the other is coming in. Now, this is very interesting. There's a whole deep dive we could do just on this, and I'm sure it's coming. But one thing I want to point out here that might put us on the right track is that um, what Casey is saying, look, when you are reading the Akashic records, you are going out into the records. So you are basically astrally traveling the way that he is astrally traveled. And it's quite interesting when you read the process of how that happens with him, as I was describing, he's floating on a beam of light. And uh, if you go into it and you look for the notes around some readings, there are some readings where the process is slightly different, um, which I also, <laughs> I think this is, yeah, this is the one where it's slightly different. I'm going to read this. So Casey is doing the same process, and he makes a few notes after this reading. He says, 
I met an East Indian man named Hezja Pasha, and he was trying to speak through me during this reading. He remembers that. Usually when Casey goes into trance, he doesn't remember anything. He actually, in fact, has dreams like he's asleep. <laughs> um, okay, so here's what he has to say. While going for the Akashic Records, it happened in a different form than the usual manner. Now I was traveling on a blue, purple, silver light, going straight to the House of Records without passing through the darkness, no horrible sights, no misshapen <laughs> bodies, you know, all the stuff he saw on the lower planes. Doesn't have to go through things that look like cities or towns. He just goes on this light and goes directly to the House of Records without passing any of that stuff. So that's interesting, too. Um, he's giving us, I think, some insights there. And we're starting to realize, oh, you know, <laughs> there's different avenues for reaching these Akashic Records. So um, now he gives an explanation on the Akashic Records. The question is, what is meant by the Book of Life? And this comes up in Revelation in the Bible. He says, the record that the individual entity itself writes upon the skein of time and space through patience, it is open when self is attuned to the infinite and may be read by those attuning to that consciousness. They say, is this the book of God's remembrances? He answers, this is the book of life. They answer, their question is, the Akashic records? And he said, those made by the individual as just indicated. So again, the reinforcement of this, and I have to say, Casey brings forward the idea of the Akashic record almost more than anybody. It's referred to in Blavatsky. Uh, Steiner talks about reading the Akasha Chronicle in Theosophy. It comes up um, through Ledbetter and others. But this is, I think, very giving us a really detailed thing because he's working with individuals going and getting the information about their past lives. While he's doing it, he's encountering all these different periods like Egypt, like Atlantis. So we're getting a hint there that all of these time periods are connected in cycles. Yeah, what do you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead, go for it. AK said, wouldn't it be interesting if the Akashic Records is just a person's, quote, past internet, ethernet history and everything they've ever said and searched? And CC says, do you think accessing the records changes the future records? Well, this is an interesting thing because... Um, that second question really dials into something, which is that Akashic record, when he's discussing it here, is he telling us then that this Akashic record, yeah, it can tune into everything that's happened in the past, but does that record go both ways? Is that also a way of seeing into the future? And does somebody, when they tap in on that level to the Akashic record, do they have that ability to do that? It's interesting when Steiner talks about it, he introduces this, the idea that you have to have almost like a communal consciousness on the psychic side to deal with it. You can't go in there blazing away. You kind of stand on the shoulders of other people who've gone in and done it. So nobody is ever actually alone in that process. They're all building on what the other person did over time. And we find that really, if you think about society in general, that's really true. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X series. This is X series 160, Akashic Rewind, Atlantis Future Past. Now it's Casey. Before it was Steiner and Blavatsky, and of course, Plato. Uh, we're going to be taking your questions here very shortly. I know I'm running over. Miss Olivia, you got the floor. Uh, Rehoboth Farm says, how do you deal with the grandfather paradox when dealing with the Akashic Records? And Skarmoge says, the question, Olivia, is does access alter the past? Would this possibly explain the Mandela effect? I mean, we always blame CERN, you know? Oh, that's really so true. Everybody feels like the timelines are off. Yes. Oh, I, I'm sure that somebody is playing around with the medium there. I don't think there's any question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing that you bring up there, though, it's very interesting. Because when you think about it, um, the way that they're describing the Akashic Record here is re-experiencing it. So Casey suggests that on the mental level, it's like watching cinema. So watching the movie of somebody's incarnation. Um, so when you think of it that way, then there's no grandfather paradox because you're just learning things about what happened in the past. Apparently, according to Steiner, we know very little about the actual past and that a lot of what's given to us 
are people's versions of history. So therefore, I think we're, we're all hip to that <laughs> at this point. Now, yeah, especially. So um, I do think that one of the things that we're looking at here is, you know, Steiner saying this is an incredible tool for us to get. And he also was like, you know, how not to make mistakes while reading the Akashic Records. So he goes very deep. But both Casey and Steiner suggest that you can be trained to read the Akashic Record. This is crucial, you know. It's one. It's one eight hundred GG Young, right? That's, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what that made me think of. And a GG would be just the one. And of course, she taps into this work as well. And I wanted to mention that uh, since I mentioned GG, is that she just did a very powerful presentation drawing on uh, Steiner's concept of the war of all against all, which I highly recommend. And um, you know, she's she's done a lot of videos recently, but that one is a live video and it's i think it's over an hour it's an incredible really phenomenal lecture don't miss it and um you know it's free but you know <laughs> send her send her some love on that because she put a lot into it and it is extraordinary okay um so a little more about the akashic from casey uh i wanted to mention this too and i know it's an aside but it was in some of these readings that uh, he was talking about the Akashic Record, and uh, he has this vision before World War II happens. And I think it's quite staggering. He had a few of these while he was conscious. You know, he had all kinds of strange activity on the psychic side while being conscious. But here's the dream. Um, and so he's sort of half asleep, half awake, but he's outside in real life, kind of sitting on a lawn chair kind of thing. And um, so he he had a conscious experience after waking up from this dream that he has. But here's the conscious experience. I was in the garden here at work when I heard a noise like the noise of a swarm of bees. When I looked to see where they were, I saw that the noise came from a chariot in the air. It's quite a vision. With four horses and a driver, I did not see the face of the driver. The experience lasted only a few minutes. I was trying to persuade myself that it was not real, that it was only imagination. When I heard a voice saying, look behind you, I looked behind and saw a man in armor, with a shield, a helmet, knee guards, a cape, but no weapon of any kind. And his countenance was like the light. His armor was silver or aluminum. He raised his hand in salute and said, the chariot of God and the horsemen thereof. Then he disappeared. I was really weak, not from the fright, but from the awe and wonder. Then the note from the secretary says, I heard Edgar Casey say that he dropped his hoe, and when he reached up his hand to mop his brow, his hand came down all red, looking as if he were sweating blood. Hewlin Casey later said that Edgar Casey ran against him in the front hall, white and shaking that day on his way to the chair to the living room. And um, then they give an interpretation of it. But it is, um, you know, these types of things, we have to remember the caliber of the individuals around this mystery teaching and um, why they really stand out over time. And there's a lot of people, you know, it reminds me very much of when I hear about all these bands that got started <laughs> after they saw, you know, Elvis on TV or after they saw the Beatles on TV or something. And you have all these guys that become the really, you know, the next generation, the next wave of it. And then all those people inspire all these other people. But it's interesting because I think with Casey and with Gurdjieff and with Steiner, you get this, which is they really inspired a, a huge movement of people trying to do it. And that's kind of remarkable as well. Now, those other people may not have been as talented or taken it as far. We may never have even heard their names, but the fact that they went down this road because of this great inspiration, um, that's, what it, that's what it reminds me of. I have more here, but with that, Miss Olivia, including Steiner Manu, I am going to turn it over to you because I'm late, 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 late on that. I'm, uh, I'm going to go straight for the jugular. <laughs> okay, MTL Momzilla says, has Steiner or anyone else predicted a war in the Middle East that brings on Armageddon? <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, there's all the blue turban Nostradamus stuff, as we know. I mean, uh, 
certainly the foundations of trouble vibrationally in the Middle East, there's been that constant warring vibration there. There's no question about it. And, um, but we have the ability, even with that, to bring it up to another level. But uh, certainly Iran figured a few times in different prophecies. And um, I think that there is a trigger with Iran and that there is something very old in all of this. So um, there's no question that the problem we're in now with the leadership we have could get out of hand very, very quickly. And when you see George W. Bush out there throwing the ball for the World Series, um, <laughs> you know you know we're in trouble then. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Chris Lothian, are there any records of time travel to do with the Atlanteans and Space Ghost? Is, is there any crossover of Atlantis and the Agarthians? Well, um, I think the best way the best sources around Atlantis, uh, around Atlantis have to do with Casey saying that they became on this side of the ocean, the mound builders uh, in America, and um, that the full-blooded uh, Atlanteans were the Iroquois nation. Um, so that's pretty interesting. The other part, I think, of this that's fascinating is that the um, the egress of the dispersion of the Atlanteans. So there are periods there. First, the island splits into three, Arian, Og, and Poseidia. And Poseidia is the island where the hot zone is. So we have Bimini, we have the coast of Yucatan, all of that stuff. And that is kind of the last vestige or holdout of the Law of One Amelius group. So when you look at it that way, um, I think that it's very important to see that a lot of those people came into the Mayan territories, came into South America, came into America. But it looks like Rata, the Egyptian priest, um, he had communicated with Poseidia and with the initiates in Atlantis and brought the records to Egypt so that they would be deposited there. And he did all that, um, founding the Giza Plateau and burying the records there. It's very interesting to me because um, when you go back into that period of time and you read the Casey work around Rata, it's fascinating because Rata is very unusual because is he even a human being? Um, he's some kind of a light being of some sort. So, you know, he acts like a, a regular person, but his setup in the Casey readings is Casey says, well, he was a daughter of zoo who didn't have an earthly father. So who then? Where did he come from? So something unusual there right off the bat. And also that Rata doesn't come from Egypt. He comes from the Caucasus. He comes from Iran in the mountains there. Um, so when he enters in, he's leading a group of about a thousand people into Egypt and he's getting visions that they need to go there. And when they show, show up, they seem like such a mob <laughs> that the ruler in Egypt, which is much very small and very primitive at the time, decides you guys can take over just with no bloodshed. <laughs> and they work together. In fact, they, they form an incredible unity there. And then this is all part of Rata's version of having the Atlantean records, having a safe place to come and how Egypt will become the center of universal activity. What's fascinating is if you go into those readings, everybody gets very obsessed about the idea that the whole plateau is 10,500 BC and that the Sphinx is 10,500 BC and that the records underneath were sent there. But if you really go deep on the Casey readings, he's telling you they, when they were setting up the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx, the Rata group with Hermes from Atlantis and all the rest of these initiates, they did archaeology. So the site is very old. Um, how far back in history does it go? And they were looking for something. And um, they found it. So there's something about Egypt. And so this gets also to your question, you're talking about wars in the Middle East and thing. There's some center of universal activity around the Middle East, and it doesn't have anything to do with oil. 
<laughs> yes. Urban Lumpkin, uh, what are TJ's thoughts on that other psychic channeler, Fre Frederick S. Oliver, who wrote a book about Atlantis first published in 1894 called A Dweller on Two Planets, and I'm Not Dead Yet, says, isn't this one uh, of the stories in A Dweller on Two Planets from his high balcony, the ruler points his finger over the invading army, and they all fall down and die. The army must be automatons. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, well, A Dweller on Two Planets, we did an episode with that, but that gets into uh, Shasta also. If you, if you really go deep on it, it's the first indication that just something very unusual about Mount Shasta having to do with a lost civilization. What's interesting about that is we have a Shasta episode coming. So you're going to hear more about a dweller on two planets, but let's face it, that's an unusual uh, book that was channeled to a teenager. And um, the information coming for like, where would somebody get information like that? It was, it was quite unique. And also he's talking about flying machines and all the rest of it. And even though it was published in 1905, it was written, I believe, in 1891. So, you know, where is he getting all this information about advanced technology <laughs> that the Atlanteans had? I mean, it is it is very unusual, I would say. And then you wonder also, there's this thread that's happening in the world. I think it's that opening of the schools and their influence. Why are all these accounts and the deep accounts of Atlantis happening then? And it seems like just like now, there's a great kind of falling away of um, the UFO stories, the ones that mattered. You know, there's this incredible wave of UFO stories from the 40s through about the late 90s. And then the whole subject matter falls away. All the important kind of encounters go away. And it becomes this military struggle with people trying to get funding for UFO defense office, right? It's a totally different thing. Um so I would say the same thing when it comes to the deeper work around Atlantis and the psychic aspect, which worked really beautifully together with the influence of Casey and all those people. So that through the eighties and the nineties, you pretty much understood, you know, if you look back on the history of those periods from 1875, when theosophy hits and then Ignatius Donnelly does um, Atlantis, the antediluvian world, and remember, he was almost, he ran for VP. <laughs> so Donnelly, you know, was a Michigan senator and he's writing about Atlantis. So it's getting in, something is moving it into the mainstream of our consciousness. And I think it's going to become a very important aspect in the future. Remember what Casey was suggesting is not only would those hall of records be opened in three different places, in Egypt and in Bimini and in the Yucatan, but he also said land would rise off the east coast of America. That's crucial. And that's that includes the Poseidon temples and things of that nature. So there's something remarkable, I think, there is a thread in the readings. Yeah, what do you got? Steiner to God. Steiner was the original conspiracy researcher. His lectures calling out the secret brotherhoods behind World War I are legendary. Yeah. And Black Wolf 76 says, the mystery schools constantly ignore the old ways of Europe in favor of Indian mysticism. This is wholly unbalanced. Well, theosophy did. So it got the incredible benefit, yes, of the Eastern initiatory um, influence. And, you know, if you go look at the Maharishi and the Beatles, I mean, that's an incredible cultural explosion. And then all of this stuff gets into our culture. Um, yoga becomes huge. Meditation. You know, these are things that we do need. And um, the thing that uh, Steiner put across, which I think is crucial, is that the Western initiatory tradition is what America is supposed to bring forward. That's what the West is for. <laughs> and they are the leaders in this period on that side of things. The Eastern aspect, the Eastern initiatory tradition set up the Western tradition. So it's the Western tradition, the Rosicrucian tradition that comes through on the mystery side with this. A um, couple of things about the Akashic record from Steiner. And, uh, you know, again, Steiner giving us this impression saying, look, you know, I'm sharing with you what I can. Yes, I know more. <laughs> But, you know, 
it's one step at a time here. Like how much can you take? And a lot of the things that we bring forward on a mass scale have to do with how well adapted the public is to the information we're bringing forward. By the time he got to World War I, he got very disgusted because he thought, well, you know, for all the efforts of the mystery schools to go public, here we are in the middle of World War I. You know, so it was very difficult for him. He thought that the mystery schools, in a sense, had failed. But he knew that they would get another chance. And he said, you know what's going to happen is in 100 years, and he said this in 1920, this whole thing is going to come around again. In anthroposophy, the spiritual science will have its chance again. So this is the doorway. This is the period that he was talking about. That's the period that we're in now. Um, here's what he has to say on the Akashic Record. It is but a small part of prehistoric human experience which can be learned by the methods of ordinary history. Historic evidence throws light on only a few thousand years, and even that archaeology and geology can teach us is very limited. Added to this limitation is the untrustworthiness which attaches to everything based upon external evidence. Very true. We need only consider how the presentation of some event, even if comparatively recent, is connected with a nation, is totally transformed on the discovery of new historic evidence. We need but compare the descriptions given by different historians of one and the same thing in order to realize at once how insecure on the ground is on which we stand. Everything belonging to the outer world of the senses is subject to time. And time destroys what in time arises. Now, external history depends on what has been preserved for us in time. And no one dependent on external evidence can even say whether it has what has been preserved is true or not. So this is really true. That's beautiful word. Yeah, he's really putting it across there. Um, so he starts to talk about how we get to the Akashic record and how this is a logical thing. Once you achieve a certain spiritual mastery, you can access these records and it's much better for humanity if we do. That's where you get all the Casey stories on Atlantis. This is where we get it all, basically. Um, okay, so he says now that um, in theosophy, it's called reading the Akashic records. Only a feeble picture of these records can be given in our language, for it is adapted to the uses of the world of the senses. And what we name with it receives at once the character of that world. Thus the narrator might give the un to the uninitiated, to one who cannot yet from his own experience convince himself of the actuality of a distinct spiritual world, the impression of being a mere visionary, if not indeed something worse. He who has won for himself the power to observe in the spiritual world there recognizes bygone events and their eternal character. They stand before him not as dead witnesses to history, but in the fullness of life, in a certain sense, the past events are played out before him, the Akashic record. Those who have learned to read such a living script can look back into a far more distant past than that which has external history depicts. And they can also, by direct spiritual perception, describe those matters which history relates in a far more trustworthy manner than is possible by the latter. So that's his real recommendation saying, look, once you learn how to do this, and he also warns about pitfalls and people's opinions and people not having the right um, perception, you know, and that you have to be really good to do this. But he's also saying, look, this is much better than the kind of interpretive history that you're getting with the outer senses and um, that we need some, you know, this is how we get the whole Atlantis part. Now, what's interesting, the mystery schools, um, they give us the whole picture of Atlantis and well, some people believe them, but in general, it's laughed off in those periods. By the 1960s, there becomes this incredible interest in it. And uh, the 70s, it's really in full swing. And there's a lot of things about Atlantis, reincarnation, the Akashic Record. It's all there. And um, I think there's a, there's a resurgence of this now. You can feel it. But what I think is interesting when we look at this is without the Akashic Record, you don't get any of it. <laughs> because basically, uh, we don't have it. You know, all we have really are records through Plato and things that are publicly available. We do have the story 
And um, it is through that process of reading the Akashic Chronicle that these mystics were able to bring forward that real truth about Atlantis, which is crucial. And by the way, sets us up for the period that we're in now. And if they were talking a hundred years ago and giving us that information, that's a long time ago that they knew it was going to hit us. <laughs> and what were they trying to do? They were trying to give us a warning. And the warning is your technology and your knowledge base is moving faster than your wisdom. And so at first we thought, oh, we're going to blow ourselves up with the nuclear bomb. And of course, Russia just canceled the nuclear test ban treaty that President Kennedy signed in 1963, which was a gigantic step forward for humanity. But I don't think it's a nuclear disaster. Um, you know, we had that kind of thought and the challenge of it in the 60s, in the 80s. It was, it was hanging over us. What's interesting is the period now that we're in is the technology overwhelming the uh, average person in their own sense of conscious reasoning. That's the real danger. And when we get into that situation, what they're laying back there as a track is kind of a roadmap saying, here's how you know when things are going wrong. You have this harmonic influence slipping in. People are separating scientific world from their spiritual life. They're splitting it off and we're going into this kind of eighth sphere overdrive where, you know, you've got a kind of virtual reality AI piece coming in and the civilization suffers. And if the civilization is made drowsy or suggestible by the technology, um, then they can fall victim to it. This is the warning at the heart of the mystery school piece. That's what they're putting out there when they're giving us our own history of Atlantis. That's much bigger than UFO <laughs> disclosure. It is Atlantis disclosure of our own history. We are the ones, you know, we're not, oh, it's not like, oh, there's some advanced thing out there. No, we, as part of Atlantis, were very advanced. That's, um, that's a heavy, heavy uh, realization. Yes, Miss Olivia. Rehoboth Farm again. Honestly, why should the public be given high level knowledge? I mean, why? What purpose would it serve? It the depends. profane just don't even care. It's like telling sheep about algebra. <laughs> Look, some of that is true, you know, and yet I always feel like, um, you know, for anything good, you need to earn whatever is good. So, if you're in a position where you're willing to earn it, then you are, should have the ability to learn it. That's the thing. But I think that there's so much that is available to us that um, there's, plenty, there's plenty to work with, and there's always more that can be added. Um, but yeah, you, know, you see the kind of impish thing with UFO disclosure, people jumping up and down. The important thing about UFO disclosure it has to do with the fact of a runaway technology that's in the hands of the government that they should have shared with the public instead of, you know, building themselves behind this kind of royal walls and keeping the information for themselves. But, um, you know, a lot of the strange thing about turning UFO disclosure into politics it's very tricky because, you know, you have people saying, oh, I can't get anything done because I'm thinking about disclosure or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know, do your life, have your real life, and then work towards these things as, in a public good um, fashion. You know, that's the way to do it. I, I you know, I, I remember I've encountered people uh, and there's an imbalance thing that goes on over and over again around the UFO file. At the same time, what's fascinating to me is the groups of people who know so much about the government and know so much about um, deep state activity, uh, great researchers and stuff, they don't want to know anything about the UFO file. And um, as far as I'm concerned, the UFO file is, if you're going to understand how the government deep state piece operates, you have got to understand the uh, UFO file aspect. I mean, you know, if you want to talk about President Kennedy's assassination, you have to know about the UFO part. So um, that's the the interesting thing to me, and also the uh, the various things that we've learned from studying that technology, and also who's operating it. Is it somebody here, or somebody coming in, or somebody in between? 
<laughs> uh, these things are very, very important. Yes, Miss Olivia. Wait, before we go any further, you're watching everyone. <laughs> the Dark Journalist Show. This is X Series 160, Akashic Rewind, Atlantis Future Past, Casey Steiner, Plato, Blavatsky, and the visions of the 21st century. We're going to be uh, taking a few more questions here. And I also want to remind you, especially if you're new here in the ideas room, to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our free newsletter. Um, that keeps us in touch. It's at darkjournalist.com. And that's really with all the incredible censorship that we're witnessing. That's the way to get around it. Uh, and there is no better way. And really what will happen is about once a week, you'll get our newsletter in your inbox and uh, it'll let you know about the incredible, and I really mean incredible, dark journalist documentaries we have coming up for you, things off the charts. And while I'm talking about that, preserve the date because uh, November 17th, we are doing JFK 60, Blue Enigma, and that is the UFO file aspect of the assassination. It's a premiere, and we put a lot into this. You guys are going to love it. And there's a lot of new information in there along uh, with the important backdrop of things that have happened there. And that's for the 60th anniversary of JFK's assassination. It's Friday, November 17th, um, right here on this channel, 8 p.m. or at darkjournalist.com as well. So with that, Ms. Olivia, you're up. Okay, Harmony Woods. Didn't Rudolf Steiner say that there would be a technology of morality that would save us? Yeah, there's a, there's a movement. Uh, it's interesting because um, the technology represents a challenge to us and also the forces that are trying to control humanity, which go beyond just, you know, corporate executives and military people. The way that Steiner sees it, he's, he's looking at it, there's a kind of cosmology to it. You know, there are beings that are attempting to block our evolution. So the evolutionary track that we're on would lead us to what he calls New Jupiter. And, you know, it's a kind of a spiritual awakening. And in the Bible, it's called New Jerusalem. Well, it's very interesting because um, the evolutionary track, the way that it stands, is being interfered with. So on that track of interference with the backdrop of anthroposophy, we're getting moved into this virtual reality eighth sphere which is controlled by Armon. And even the, you know, the way that the cycles are laid out in Anthroposophy and in the Casey work, you go through the different planets like schools. And, you know, not in a physical body. You're in a physical body here, but you go through the various planets. And then in that cycle, you come back, you reincarnate back to Earth. And then at a certain point, you know, Arcturus is the doorway out of this system and into a, a different development. But um, what happens supposedly is there's a, a kind of warmth that's developed on an etheric level from our experience. And all that's being interfered with by this process, by the harmonic forces, which uh, are trying to harvest humanity into this virtual world, you know, into this metaverse kind of thing where you're plugged in. And um, so we get into very tricky territory when we get, overwhelmed and people are born into thinking, you know, Google, uh, I remember having an intern and uh, she was constantly obsessed with Google alerts and Google <laughs> this and Google. And I said, you know, you don't, you actually don't need to use Google for anything, <laughs> uh, you know, except that it's associated with YouTube. And, um, you know, she lived and died on the thing. I mean, it was kind of incredible. And, um, you know, for me, just looking at that influence in someone's life. And then I think of the younger crew, you know, the people coming into it as teenagers and adopting the technology. <clears throat> of course, she's alive and well. <laughs> That's just uh, an expression. But um, the, the interesting thing when I think about that observation is just how tied up she was with the software of Google and thinking that that is kind of a babysitter. You know, there was a weird thing there that just was not necessary. So it's a, there was a kind of inappropriate relationship with the technology. And I think there needs to be a name for this besides just, you know, being addicted to video games or something. And um, I think the eighth sphere 
is a fantastic uh, learning stepping stone that Steiner has left for us. And there's a reason that he concentrated on the eighth sphere in Armon and this whole idea that he gives about the technological future and the challenges involved because it can threaten the entire evolutionary process of humanity over time. That's the danger. So uh, I think if we keep that in mind, we're already ahead of the game. The problem is, according to Steiner, is that if that harmonic force in the 21st century comes upon humanity in a drowsy fashion, if it is suggestible and unaware of this thing coming in, then it's game over. So that's how dangerous um, this period of time is. And look at how much unmasking is going on, say, over the past five years of just how diabolical the people who are in charge are. And, um, you know, they're under some kind of sway or influence, and now they can't even hide it. <laughs> that's even scarier. Yes, Miss Olivia. Adam Huglow, uh, Project Looking Glass and Montauk Project, whilst X must also have tried to tap the Akashic. And Helena mm -hmm. Wilcox says, do people need your permission to read the Akashic record? Your Akashic record. Well, it's very interesting. That exact question comes up in a Casey reading. And um, what he says is that uh, in order to go read it, he needs to be prompted by somebody. So if somebody says, go and read <laughs> my Akashic record so you can get my past lives and everything else that gives him the permission to go and do it. Um, there's a very fascinating section that Steiner gives us in relation to what is, it's actually almost disturbing. It's about misinterpreting the Akashic record. And he was going through the work of Emanuel Swedenborg, as we know as an earlier mystic, very, very interesting. But Swedenborg claimed to have tapped in and talked to these historic figures, um, like Roman, you know, famous Roman emperors and things like that. So rather than just saying, well, Swedenborg is off his rocker, look, Swedenborg, the reason they have all these Swedenborg churches around here <laughs> uh, at Harvard is because Swedenborg, you know, was the real thing. There was a huge movement for him. So he's a real mystic. And uh, he was very advanced and ahead of his time. But part of his, you know, mystical thing was going to other planets and, you know, all this other stuff. So, and that we're talking, you know, 1700s, <laughs> very far back or even earlier. Um, so there's a very interesting explanation here in Steiner's work, which I think will give us a heads up on that. And we'll take a couple more of your questions. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is Akashic Rewind, Atlantis, Future Past, Casey Steiner, and Photo Visions, Plato Visions, and Photo Visions, if you read the Akashic Record like photos. <laughs> we'll take a few more of your questions, and uh, it's great to have you here. And it's, it's also uh, probably when we get around the subject like the Akashic Record, you're getting right to the heart of the mystery traditions. So it's good to be here. Any ideas from talking with you about it? Casey uh, Steiner says, the further back we go into the past, the more we have to rely on the Akashic Chronicle. And the further back we go, the purer these records are. It's easiest to read in far, far back earth states before the earth was physical. It's much more difficult to read it during the Atlantean period and most difficult of all during the post-Atlantean period, for the reader must carefully eradicate from his soul all his knowledge of these times, that it may not falsify the chronicle. Therefore, it is easier to investigate something about the most ancient times of which one does not have yet any images. You don't have any impressions. You know, right now, if we go back to Egypt, we're like, oh, you know, it's a bunch of people walking around the pyramids, they're slaves. <laughs> um, but here's the strangeness, and it has to do with individualities surviving in that Akashic Chronicle long after the soul has moved on. And is this what they're getting at with AI? And is this what they're getting at with the avatar and all the rest? Listen closely. There can be great confusion if someone not quite sure how to read these characters. For example, if someone lived in Roman times, let's say Virgil, when we perceive Virgil in the Akashic Chronicle, it seems like a living picture. 
like real life. It's like a repetition of life itself. We can now see this Virgil life playing itself out anew. It is a faithful reproduction of what took place at the time. If you address a question to this picture, it answers as Virgil could possibly have answered. Swedenborg spoke to the Akashic image of Virgil. The individuality of Virgil himself had undergone a different development of its own. If someone cannot distinguish accurately, he may confuse it. This opens up all kinds of incredible <laughs> possibilities. Here's what Steiner is saying. He's saying, look, you can look in on a historical figure. And in this case, he's saying someone can even interact with it and it will answer them. And he's saying the reflected image on the Akashic record is also doing its own development. But the actual person has moved on a long time ago. And they've moved into another life. <laughs> but somehow the reflected image, the shell that it animated, still is growing on some level and so can respond and have these interactions. Something very strange about that, because for me, it's a lifeless shell because the actual life has moved along, but it's left this impression there. It's almost like a museum, it's, but it's also like an AI <laughs> avatar of the original character. The only thing that is unusual about it all is that, according to Steiner, that impression of this character in that period of time is still developing. How does that work? This gets us into very, very deep territory. <laughs> Miss Olivia, go okay, for it. Okay, I've got a, a whole unit here. Scarmoge, um, now we're cooking. Might a, quote, re-experience also possibly mean the opportunity for reinterpretation as well? If so, then the past is possibly altered. Karen mm. Carpenter, is the Akashic record mutable? Can the future change in the Akashic record? And mm. Igmu too, by knowing the past, we can act in the now to create a be better future. How does this time thing work? Because one of the things from all of my um, near-death experience video stuff that research is that what everybody seems to say is that all time is one time. One of your sayings yes. is that this the past and the future don't really exist on the other. They say all these lifetimes are happening simultaneously. And furthermore, we are, I, I'm not just one being experiencing life on the planet right now we have parallel lifetimes. So this gets really cosmic. So wow. how does this interplay work? Well, yeah. And you, you're you really on uh, near-death experiences and things like that. I think you have tremendous information. You're, you have great insight on it. What I would say is this. There's more <laughs> from this theme in this Steiner quote. But this is what I will say about it. I think that um, there, there's something when you go into the deep teachings around the mysteries, they all say the same thing, that when seen from the highest, there is no space, there is no time. So these are conceptual. So if there is no time, um, you know, you start to see a number of different things and possibilities. Now, we understand developmental stages because we grow up as children into teenagers, then adults, and then into older people. Now, um, but that is our experience. But in terms of what our astral body is or who we actually are, the spiritual connection that we have, um, it doesn't, it's ageless, basically. We're in a factor of time coming into materiality. So that goes, you know, now it's taking us into very deep territory. With that in mind, and thinking about time gaps or time slips, <laughs> things of this nature. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, and let's, on that note, hold on. I got to yeah. ask this question. CC yeah, yeah. says, when you dream, do you, end, do you enter and experience other time streams? I know I have. Have you? Well, here's the interesting thing. So, um, there is an interesting thing about dreams in Ledbetter's work. And he said there, you know, there's three types of dreams. One type of dream is based on uh, your digestive system. So it, it has to do with your physical body. So it can excite different types of different thinking. 
The other one has to do with your psychological evaluation of yourself and your interaction with other people. That's most of the dreams that we have, in fact. But then there's a third type of dream which steps outside of space and time. So that level of dreaming, which comes from this kind of superconscious aspect of who we are, that level of dreaming is the reason why you you know, dream of a friend you haven't seen in two years and suddenly they show up on your doorstep or they call. Um, it's That's a completely timeless area, so you get a snapshot of it. Here's another thing to consider on that front. They were asking Casey a series of questions about time, and he said, you know, one of the questions that snuck in there was, well, you know, do we perceive time as it's actually happening? And Casey said, no. And they said, well, what's the gap between what we perceive and what's actually happening? And Casey said, well, it can be as much as 20 years. So your mind is processing things at a much slower pace than they're coming in. So therefore, those of us um, who have the gift to be able to see into the future are people who just are able to see and perceive things. So they're given that gift. Um, so therefore, when you get somebody who has this incredible quality where they can see things into the future, um, a lot of it is that their psychic mind is picking up on events that are coming in, but it's also that they have the ability to perceive things faster than the general public because the regular average person, it can be, as Casey said, your mind is catching on to things 20 years back from when they're actually happening. Well, for me, when I heard that, I thought that was extraordinary and it explained a great deal as well. It also explains a certain amount of deja vu uh, when we put it that way. Okay, now, we're getting into something yes. really interesting. This is, do not change the subject, All right, please. all right, okay. Okay. No, this so, is not going to change it, but this is the, the end of that. Okay, I'll wait. No, 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 it's okay. I'll take well, a question okay, first. It, okay, well, I was thinking about it in terms of healing, personal healing, but we can look at it as global healing also. Yes. Okay, so some people like to frame it as, as a... Um, like a timeline shift, you know, imagine as if it's, you know, okay, so let's say the Middle East, you know, yes, hold the vision for peace. Like, um, you know, war is over if you want it. That was that message actually, which makes more sense now. So I think personally you could uh, tap into, you could say, you could, doesn't matter what you call it. You call it the past, you call it the future, whatever, but let's say you're ill and you um, tap into a part of yourself, your soul, that is uh, shining with health, that is perfectly whole and healthy, mm. and you bring it into the present moment. Oh, right? yeah. And so that is, you know, this is a shamanic sort of soul retrieval uh, ritual um, for healing. This no is question. where we're headed, right? Yes. I mean, the Akashic is like a big topic, but what we really want to do is know how to play with it so that we can manifest the reality we want to be experiencing, not Armageddon. No, I, I agree with that. Um, look, um, the, the heart of the Casey work is thoughts are things. So what you project ultimately becomes your reality. Um, so, you know, the idea that they're building up an Armageddon scenario, you know, it's not like we're supposed to ignore the fact of the danger around the world. I always go back to this Ospensky quote, which is quite interesting. He was talking during World War II, and in his audience was somebody who said, you know, all this self-development is fine, but how are we supposed to develop ourselves with all this chaos of World War II going on around us, you know, where these bombs could be dropped on us in London at any time? And he said, well, as you work on yourself and the psychology of your own possible evolution, an interesting thing happens, which is conditions have a different impact on you. And the conditions themselves might be different. This is interesting. Now, what he was suggesting was that by moving into a different state of awareness, you actually move into a different state of reality. <laughs> so that, you know, the world goes into World War III or whatever, but because your own consciousness has changed, you're not in that reality. Uh, that's what I took away from it. And I've, I've pondered that one a lot. I think that Ospensky had a lot of this kind of insight <laughs> and quite remarkable. Now, 
going along with this same idea of this kind of AI avatar hanging mm-hmm. out on the Akashic record. This one you'll like, Miss Olivia. Watch okay. this. These Akashic pictures speak a confusing language because the Akasha is alive. The Akasha image of Caesar must not be compared with Caesar's individuality, which may already have been reincarnated again. This sort of confusion may be easily arise if we have gained access to the Akasha pictures by external means. Want to explain that one, Steiner? Hence, they often play a part in spiritualistic seances. The spiritualist imagines he's seeing a man who has died when it is really only his Akashic picture. Thus, a picture of Girta may appear as he was in 1796. And if we are not properly informed, we may confuse this picture with Goethe's individuality. It is all the more bewildering because the image is alive and answers questions. And the answers are not those given in the past, but quite new ones. They are not repetitions of anything that Goethe actually said, but answers he might well have given. It is even possible that this Akashic image of Goethe might write a poem in Goethe's own style. The Akasha pictures are real, living pictures. Strange as these facts may seem, they are nonetheless the facts. <laughs> so, uh, Miss Olivia, wow. Think about that. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Akashic Rewind. <laughs> Atlantis, future, past. Casey Steiner and Plato Visions revealed. Uh, we're going to take a couple more of your questions. I want to remind everyone our special JFK 60 premiere, November 17th. And uh, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be very special. Make sure you're there. Friday, November 17th, 8 p.m., JFK 60, Blue Enigma, the UFO file, and the Secret Space Program. Uh, and uh, also, if you're new here, make sure that you sign up for the newsletter. That is coming up uh, for you. It's a free newsletter. And, uh, you know, it gets us around this incredible and kind of bizarre censorship that we've experienced. And uh, it's not the kind of thing I like to complain about, but my God, (laughs) they've done a lot to suppress us and we've done a lot to get around it too. So we're all here together tonight, but uh, that newsletter is key. If you're not on there yet, make sure you hop on there tonight. And now we'll take the last round of questions. Miss Olivia, you're up. I need to make sure I ask this question. So (laughs) Red Cap Goblin said, I need the cheat codes from the Akashic Records because I am a completionist. I am a completionist as well. (laughs) Um, I hate leaving anything like a movie undone. So what, what is our responsibility here with our lifetimes? With the Akashic Records, like in the ultimate sense. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you, you're always doing your best. I think Kennedy put it very, very well. He said to exercise your powers along the line of excellence. So, um, those powers include spiritual powers. And, uh, so we have to really keep that in mind to really go forward and be our best. And, um, I think it's interesting uh, there's a Casey reading where he says, who can tell, you know, the wind how to blow or the sound how to flow, you already know. So, you know, that's, it's already dialed in there. You already have the pattern. You just bring that out forward for yourself. So that's how I would. I'm going to throw that. this out there. Tina Boric says to progress. And um, isn't there a Casey thing where it says the point is to, to move, not stay still. This is the whole th- uh, biblical story about the talents right? Oh yeah. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. That it's better to try and fail and even oh, accrue negative karma versus just, you know, stagnating, which I think is t- terrible because it's what so many young people are doing today is there's no progress. They're not allowed to make progress in their lives, right? They're, they're purposefully kept down, right? They can't, <laughs> so many of them can't go to school or they, you know, they can't buy a house. They can't get married. They can't have children. There's no, oh, yeah. I know. So you're what? stuck living in your parents' basement trying to make progress <laughs> in your life. It's very <sighs> difficult. Basically you're in almost like in a prison cell mm. praying and meditating and studying, I guess, because that's what you have is, you know, these little four walls and this like reduced lifestyle. Mm. Well, um, yeah, you need to see your way clear through anything like that. And also, 
um, you know, to take the environment as a challenge to improve it. And also, um, it's fascinating because for me, I think Casey was referring more there to an individual's life when he said, you know, sometimes the thing is to move, not to procrastinate too much. And, um, you know, you don't want to make the wrong move, but make sure you're in action ultimately and make sure that you're moving forward in a constructive fashion. And a lot of that has to do again with thought. And, um, you know, I remember in the Gurdjieff work, he talks about how negative thinking is an artificial center and his proof for it was simple. He said, you know, I can imagine that somebody would have daydreams. You know, this is the way you have to control your mind, but you can imagine somebody daydreaming their life away about positive things. But what on earth can be the purpose of daydreaming <laughs> away your life with negative thinking? So you can see that there's something very artificial about <laughs> it. And it's funny because in the, the Gurdjieff work, what they do is they artificially suppress, you know, so they, they figure the negative uh, emotional side, the negative thought side is so negative and it's so unnatural that they actually suppress it. So if a negative thought comes up or a negative expression, zap it. And other people would say like, well, you know, you're suppressing this stuff. It'll come back on you. Not the Gurdjieff work, actually. When it came to negative emotions, that one <laughs> he left out. Yes, Miss Olivia. I love this. Rehoboth Farm says Judaism teaches that every human being has a mitzvah gadol, a great good deed that they must complete in life. It's if you mm. live your life thinking that there must be something, it doesn't have to be big. Sometimes it can be small. Sometimes it, it can be a moment and sometimes it can be a life of service to someone in need. But really that there's sure, yeah. one great deed that you must do in your life and that to seek it. And I like the, uh, yeah, I like the service and attunement um, piece in Edgar Casey's work. So we spend all this time in attunement trying to attune ourselves. Um, whether it's meditation, psychic function, whatever it happens to be. So that's the attunement. But um, the service aspect, if the attunement isn't fulfilled in some kind of a service aspect, whatever that shape that takes, then it overflows and it becomes, you know, almost an explosion in a sense. And it doesn't reach its potential. It's, you know a kind of a spilling out. So um, that's very interesting. You have attunement, but attunement's partner is service. So I think we spend a great deal of time trying to figure out uh, attunement, but it's really service is what it's all about. And very often, you know, I've pointed this out when it comes to any of these really kind of amazing uh, figures in esoteric history, they concentrate and they say, well, you know, when they came to Casey, they said, well, we want to learn how to do this astral projection. And we want to learn all these psychic abilities. And he said, let's do it. You know, let's, we'll do a reading on it. And so they ask him these questions, you know, how do I put myself in on this track where I can develop telepathy, where I can develop astral projection, all the rest of it. And he said, well, put yourself in the right state of mind by pushing an elderly person along the beach there at Virginia beach. And the person is noticeably irritated when it comes up and he says, well, what do you mean? You know, like and he says, well, that'll put you in the right frame of mind of doing a service for somebody to receive these other gifts basically. So, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is how it works. It's, um, there's a whole kind of group of literature that's out there that is really all about how to manifest things. And, you know, we all have seen those and I'm all for it. I want people to manifest the good things they want in their life, but I do think it's important um, to keep the service aspect well balanced in it or else it becomes very imbalanced very quickly. Yes, Miss Olivia. Michael Snow. So if this is all a simulation, has Armand hacked the simulation code? Ah, uh, Armand. Remember that's Steiner's, um, very, very interesting sculpture of Armand. And it tells us a great deal, actually. As a matter of fact, while he was doing it, he felt himself getting heavy, and he described the feeling as concrete by tuning into Armand. 
Aramon is a thick, heavy, dense force, and uh, it has tremendous sway over the Earth plane. And the story in the cosmology of Anthroposophy is quite wild, that when the moon was leaving the Earth, humanity was at its most vulnerable point, and that Aramon got into the actual evolution of humanity. So we're facing off against it, but we can learn a great deal for it in the battle uh, against Aramon. That battle, though, if you really think about it, is the battle between um, the scientific materialism versus a spiritual state of mind, how the two should actually work together. That's the whole kind of key of spiritual science. And it's interesting. I don't even think spiritual science is that original um, of a concept. There was something called the spiritual scientist that was like a magazine in the period of Steiner's time. So it was, it was out there, you know, this, this whole concept, this whole theme. And I think it's very important because um, we can't let, you know, when you see people do this all the time where they go into this whole mode where they make science, the new God, right? And you can't challenge science. Look at the COVID op. <laughs> They're willing to, you know, get rid of half the population who disagreed with them. Um, because they were trusting pharmaceutical companies who were after profits. So think about it. You know, we we are, have been face to face directly with this. The schools, the teachings, the individuals have paved the way for us to have the knowledge and the tools to face off against this period of Aramon in the eighth sphere. And I think, it, you know, it's those names are what. Steiner adopted them too, but they show up in some way, shape, or form in the other teachings as well. So really, this is an incredible piece of the mystery teachings giving us that awareness. And when you get to that point where you start tuning in, you get more feedback. It's like the, the uh, spiritual tuning in builds on itself, and you become a better version of who you are. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, there's there's nobody, you know, who really uh, who who doesn't have the ability to do this. So even if somebody, you know, has really hit an incredible low point in their life, the tools are embedded here in these teachings, and they take they take a range of, you know, of the most absurd things. It's funny when I was reading about Blavatsky. Um. You know, her sister was saying, you know, she, uh, it was a weird thing that uh, when she came back to live with us after this eight years, you know, uh, I said, well, you know, there's this job over here, this other place, this other symphony is looking for a, a trained classical pianist, which you are, and she wanted to hook her up with all these different gigs. And Blavatsky was like, you know, I want to work in this clothing factory. <laughs> and she did. And she was, you know, the shizzle in the clothing factory. So it, you know, it works on all kinds of different levels. And I've pointed this out before, which is, um, you know, when it comes to the mystery teachings, the, if you are <laughs> a librarian, then, you know, it's the mystery teaching. It operates there. The fourth way school operates on the level exactly where you are. So um, if you're a librarian, you know, or if you're an executive, or if you work in a car wash, it doesn't make any difference. In fact, um, your attention to detail is probably the most important thing. It's interesting, there's a story, a Gurdjieff story about attention, and how the schools had taught him that attention was the most important thing in, in life in order to develop yourself, and your ability to give your attention. So this becomes very interesting when you think about it. And they were all about developing your being. So uh, Ospensky asked Gurdjieff, well, who was the person in your regular life that you met who, who had the most being? You know, like, and he tried to name these different people. And he said, no, no, during the, some of the Armenian wars, um, there was a person that I knew and he had to watch a certain area of an entrance to a cave or something. So with his gun, he had to watch it. And because he was trained to watch it and he was in that post for six months, his ability to give his concentration had exceeded 
almost anyone else that Gurdjieff had met. And Gurdjieff had met ascended masters and all the rest of it. So each of us have the ability in whatever, uh, you know, condition or situation that we're in, you know, the greatest situation in the world might not be the most uh, productive spiritually, psychically, or otherwise. It might be distracting. So, um, you know, there's a series of readings that uh, Casey gives for, I think it's Cold Porter. Gershwin and Porter both got readings. And I th I'm going to say it's Cold Porter where he said, what can I do to really give myself to my music? And he said, sleep in a bed that's not comfortable, yeah. be in a very stripped down thing, don't go to the cinema, like live this very kind of almost ascetic lifestyle to get the most. Isn't that fascinating? So that stimulated okay. the creativity. I mean, it was an individual reading for sure, but it's something to think about. And with that, Miss Olivia, the last question of the night, you're up. Playful tones, aren't we supposed to redeem Aramon at some point in our human evolution? Yeah, that's true, actually, um, or at least the choice is there. But as long as Aramon is everywhere successful, then we'll never get an opportunity to do that. Um, what's interesting is the way that Steiner puts it is that we can obtain in the exchange or the battle with Aramon, we can obtain for Christ the abilities of Aramon. Um, so for humanity and uh, Christ, the battle with Aramon, that's the way that Steiner puts it. And the whole mystery of uh, Golgotha is the, you know, the incredible earthquake that sets us off on a different evolutionary track, which is the one that we're on. And um, that spiritual evolutionary track is very important, but it's got this kind of built-in block with it. And uh, in anthroposophy, it's, it's Aramon. What's interesting to me and why I take it more literally than just kind of a mythology is that there's too much insight that Steiner has to the way that these beings are playing into humanity's life wave. And um, for me, I have seen the thinking aspects of people who are involved in technology or high finance, and they seem to be manipulated by a greed <laughs> and a lack of self-awareness that uh, seems to exceed just day-to-day -day living. So for me, you know, I think I've seen, I've had a glimpse of that harmonic uh, impulse up close. And um, Steiner just called it too clearly. It's almost like he was reading ahead a hundred years and was pointing things out to us saying, here's what's coming. And, you know, Steiner put a lot in, I think. The question is, what do we do with it? How does our own awareness um, arise from all those teachings that are left there? And, uh, you know, for me, they are, they're far more than historic teachings. They, it's a, there's a kind of a living teaching involved, which is constantly evolving, and it evolves with us and this uh, new era of the mysteries we're engaged in. And with that, Miss Olivia, we are done for tonight. Yeah, what a show. Unbelievable ideas from out there tonight. Just off the charts with everyone, and uh, your super chats are up. Okay, so I have... I am I and I, Eurythmia is fun, Sun Hero, Ricardo Petrazzi, Les Scott, Lisa, Norman Smith, Donna G, Durbin Downey, B. Brax, Robert Scott, Mark Lane, Tricky Vicky, Helena Wilcox, Debbie Klingelsmith, uh, Happy Hermit 3D, Terry Doherty, Nancy Mercier, Bo Krills, Roosevelt Media News, Herbert Lumcan, Copernicus, Thermobstrafel, Jonathan McIntosh, Amarillo Gunrunners, Agnes Fair. The Objective Collective, Nathan Allen, Boomhauer89, W.C. Ray, Sarah Jane, Karen Carpenter, Zero Infinity Live, John Von Braun, and Infinitum Neo. Thank you so much for your generous Super Chats. Fantastic. And we really appreciate uh, your support. We couldn't do it without you. And to all our subscribers and the people who get behind uh, the work that we do here, thank you. And uh, you allow us to bring to you the shows that we produce and we, we definitely are grateful we couldn't do it without you. We will be back with you next week, and we have some surprise interviews I want to reemphasize 
Friday, November 17th, 8 p.m. Mark it in your calendar. Get ready for that premiere. It is going to be something special. And it is for uh, the JFK 60th anniversary, the Blue Enigma and uh, the UFO file and the secret space program with the assassination. Just an incredible uh, series of revelations set there. And I'll do a couple of shout outs before we go. <laughs> Nathan Allen. <laughs> Najat Madri, I love learning on a Friday night. It's great to be here with you. Thank you, Najat. Cindy Gillespie. That's nice. Diana says, awesome community. DJ, Olivia, and all blessings to everyone. It's great to have you here, Diana. And Scarlet Fire. God in one's heart, not in the cloud. Satan in one's mind, not ruled over by one's heart. Isn't that? That's very fitting, I would say. I like this Camelot, y'all. Exactly. I'm telling you, Camelot is right there. Never let it be forgot. Certainly once there was a Camelot. Um, there we go. Never let it be forgot. Now Actually, we're that's a good point. Camelot is an egregore, a positive egregore. Oh, yes. No question. So we can actually bring that down. I think of it as, um, you know, it's actually very interesting because I think of it as an archetype that can be activated whenever humanity puts its mind to it. So yum. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Roosevelt's out there. DJ's hair is elevated. I, you know, <laughs> nothing special, nothing special. Helena Wilcox. Yes. Project looking glass, Alice in Wonderland. Well, you know, Alice, whenever we get around the Alice in Wonderland story, we're going deep uh, along with Dorothy, our friend here. Uh, agreed. Scarlet fire, John, Beppo. Fantastic. <laughs> Wait, I'm going all the way to the bottom. Here we go. Salt of the Earth. Excellent. Bo Krill's Adam Huglo. Yeah. There we go. I like that. <laughs> True. Mordred killed King Arthur. Um, hey, listen, that's the Excalibur. You know, it goes on. It reanimates itself over and over again. The king rises up. The king is challenged. Um, there's a great dynamic involved there. It is the struggle between the very, very good and the very, very evil. DJ rules. Mm -hmm. Danny Warren. Thank you, sir. Wow. Fantastic group tonight. We will see you all next week and have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Uh, I wanted to say that the comments and the questions in the ideas room tonight were completely off the charts. Wasn't that great? Uh, and Miss Olivia, bravo. Nicely done. My goodness. And uh, at a certain point, you you an you gave were given great answers yourself. <laughs> <coughs> I <got> Kono. inspired. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, DJ Olivia and Ideas Peoples. There we go. Uh, free, free. Looking forward to it. We will see you all on November 17th, uh, but we'll also see you next Friday. So I'll give the big build up for that then. Did I leave anything else out? I wanted to show you. Well, we'll get to it next time. But you know what? There's a young man <laughs> who didn't do so Cancel. well in school. They couldn't figure out how can you get this guy, you know, to give us, he's all F's. What's going on here? Well, that is Rudolf Steiner in school. And what happened? He found geometry and all of his grades went off the charts and he became the scholar that we know. So something about that geometry triggered him off into mm -hmm. his Tao. <laughs> so we'll see you all and never let it be forgot once there was a Camelot. And, uh, you know, it says end broadcast up there, but Miss Olivia never really ends. Never really ends. We'll see you all next week. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. God bless everybody. X160.